Hello, my name is Mr. Asprey, and this is the whole of the Edexcel IGCSE higher tier course in one video. I've gone through the course and I've categorized it into 60 topics. For each topic in this video, I've created examples that are going to test the key skills that you're going to need for your IGCSE exam. I've also created accompanying videos for every single topic, whereby I go over four or five common IGCSE past paper questions. There are also some tricky questions in there as well, so that you feel really prepared when you go into your IGCSE exam. Now, I think the best way for you to use this resource is to watch the topic examples in this video, and then click the link and try and do some of the past paper questions and then watch my solutions afterwards. I really hope that you find this resource useful and if you were to like the video, subscribe and share it with your friends, I'd be greatly appreciative. Okay, let's get into it. Number one, prime factors, highest common factor and lowest common multiple. Right, let's get it. In order to split up a number into prime factors, you have to write the number out, draw a tree diagram like this, I can divide 240 by two and that will give me 120. Now because 2 is prime, I circle it. So here I'm going to get 2 and 60, and I'll circle the 2 again. You don't have to just pick 2 every time though, you can pick for example 6 and 10, and 6 would go to 2 and 3, both prime, and 10 will go to 2 and 5. We could then um, count how many 2's we have. In this case we have 4, so I can write it's equal to 2 to the power of 4. And we've also got one 3 here. So I write times by 3. And we've also got a 5 here. So I write times by 5. And there we have it. Okay, my top tip for working out highest common factor and lowest common multiple is to draw a Venn diagram. The highest common factor is all the numbers in the middle multiplied and the lowest common multiple is all the numbers in the Venn diagram multiplied. Right, let's do an example. So I'll draw a Venn diagram like such. I would label this A and this B. I would then write out A as 2 times 2, because there's 2 squared, times 3, times 5 squared, so 5 times 5. And I would write B as 2 cubed, which is 2 times 2 times 2, times by 3 squared, 3 times 3, and times by 7. Now, which ones do they share? Well, they both have a 2, so I could put a 2 in the middle. They also have another 2, so I could put that in the middle as well. And they have a 3, which can go in the middle. And they have a... Also, A now has two 5s, so they can go over here. And B has 2, 3, and 7, so they can go over here. Now... The highest common factor is all the middle numbers multiplied together. So in this case, that is 2 times 2 times 3, and that's equal to 12. And the lowest common multiple are all the numbers multiplied together. So this is 5 times 5. We have 12 in the middle. We know that times to 12, so I can just take a shortcut there. And we have 2 times 3 times 7. And this, when I multiply all those together, gives me two, uh, 1, 2, comma, 6, 0, 0. Uh, click the link here to try some exam questions on this topic. And let's move on to the next one. Here we have fraction operations. What we need to remember is if we are adding or subtracting fractions, we have to find the lowest common denominator. And if we're multiplying, we just do the top times the top and the bottom by the bottom. And if we're dividing, we have to remember keep, flip, change. Okay, let's do it. So the first question here, I want to find a common denominator and the lowest one would be 20. You could use 40, but 20 would be better. Times this one, top and bottom by 5, to make 20 on the bottom. And this one, top and bottom by 2, again, to make 20 on the bottom. 3 times 5 is 15. 4 times 5 is 20. 7 times 2 is 14. And 10 times 2 is 20. And this is going to give us 1 20th because 15 minus 14 is 1. I'm multiplying fractions now, but what I need to do is I need to convert this into an improper fraction. So what I do is I do 3 multiplied by 2, and then I add 1 on. 
So three times two is six, plus one is seven. So this gives me seven thirds. And I'm multiplying that by three fifths. Now, because I have a factor of three on the top and a factor of three on the bottom, I can cancel before I times. I can divide this by three to get one, and this by three to get one. Now I just times top by top, and that's seven times by one, which is seven, and bottom times bottom is one times five, which is just five. Again, I've got a mixed number here, so I'm gonna convert it first. I multiply one and five, and then I add on three. So one times five is five, add three is eight. So this is eight fifths divided by three over four. Now we have to remember keep, flip, change. So I keep the first one the same. I flip the second one over and then I change the sign to a multiplication. I can check for factors and there is no common factors here. Eight and four do not go into five and three. So I can't have any factorizing here. So I can just multiply the top by the top to get 32 and the bottom by the bottom to get 15. And then quite commonly they'll ask you to convert it back into a, a mixed number. So how many 15s go into 32? Well 15 goes into 30 twice and 32 will have two left over. Okay, click the link here to try some exam questions and then let's move on to the next question. Number three, probability. The one thing we must remember when doing any probability question is that the sum of all the outcomes must add up to one whole. So let's get into this question. It says that the probability of landing on blue is the same as landing on green. So that means we can label the probability of both of them the same thing. So let's call it X. And then it asks us to work out what these probabilities are. Well, like I've just said, the sum of all the probabilities. So in this case, I'm going to add up all of these possibilities here and that will equal one. 0 0.18 plus 0 0.26 is 0 0.44, and we've got two x's here, that's equal to one. Subtract 0 0.44 from both sides, gives me that two x is equal to 0 0.56, and then divide through, that gives me x is equal to 0 0.28. Next example, we have a similar distribution probability table, and we've got this one here missing, so I'm gonna call this one X. And once again, I'm gonna add up all of the probabilities. And I'm gonna write that this is equal to one. This gives me 0 0.76 plus x is equal to 1, so subtracting 0 0.76 gives me that x is equal to 0 0.24. We're then told that the uh, dice is rolled 200 times. It says work out an estimate for the times it will land on 2 or on 4. Well, the probability of 2 is 0.2, and the probability of 4 we've just worked out. So in total, the probability of 2 or 4 is adding these two probabilities together. Because top tip, if you are, if you see the word or, we're gonna add probabilities. If you see the word and, we're gonna multiply probabilities. And this is equal to 0 0.44. And if we're asked to work out an estimate or how much we would expect you see these words, then what we need to do is multiply the number of times that the event is going to take place by the probability of the particular outcome that we want. And this is going to give me 88. Okay, that's probability one done. Click the link to try common and tricky exam questions on this topic. Okay, sequences. My top tip for this is we need to work out the gap between them each time. In this case, it's going up in seven, so it's plus seven N. And then we need to figure out what number would have gone here if the sequence were to go back one step. Well, I'd have to take away seven. This will give me minus three. Okay, let's do some more examples. This case, the gap between them is actually going down. 
It's going down by 4, so we write minus 4 in each of the gaps, and therefore it's very similar to minus 4n. But we need to work out what to add on or take away, and again I go for my magical term at the start, what number would go in there, so if I was going backwards, I'd have to add on 4, and that number would be 39. So it's minus 4n plus 39. And this time we're, we're given an nth term, we're asked to work out the first three terms of the sequence. Well, n would equal 1 in the first instance, and then 2, and then 3. When n is 1, I'm going to be doing 1 squared plus 3, and that's 1 times 1 plus 3, which is 4. When n is 2, I'll be doing 2 squared, which is 4, plus 3 is 7. And when n is 3, I'll be doing 3 squared is 9, plus 3 is 12. And the tenth term in the sequence is when n is 10. So I'll be doing 10 squared plus 3, which is 103. Next question, we're asked to work out when this sequence will first term negative. Well, we can see that it's going down in 4 by 4s, so we could just work out what the next terms would be. So it would be 11, and then it would be 7, and then it would be 3, and then it would be minus 1. So minus 1 would be the first negative term. Is minus 30 a term in this sequence? Well, the quickest way of doing that is to work out what the nth term is. And again, we can see it's going down by 4 each time. So it's minus 4n, and the number that would go at the start, if there was a number there, would have to add on 4, so it would be 35. Now, does this sequence ever equal minus 30? Well, let's solve for n, and if we get a whole number, then it means it will be in the sequence. So solving for n, I can subtract 35 from both sides to give you minus 65, and then dividing through by minus 4 does not give me a whole number. It gives me 16.25, and that is not a whole number, so the answer is no. Okay, click the link to try some exam questions, and now let's move on. Okay, constructions. You need a rule and compass for this. It's quite tricky for me. I don't have a rule and compass on my device, but I will try my best. Right, what we need to do is put the needle right there and draw a semicircle around. So that it's going to come down something like that, cut through there, and then cut through there. So these are my new two points. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the needle here and the pen right here. And I'm going to draw a semicircle around like so. And then I'm going to swap it over and I'm going to put the needle here and the pen here. And I'm going to draw a second semicircle which is going to come around like this. And then all that's left to do is to connect up the two intersection points here and here. And they should pass through C and also be at right angles to the line, thus making it a perpendicular. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is put my needle here, and then I'm going to draw a semicircle. And then I'm going to put my needle on that intersection point and draw a semicircle a bit further up. And then I'm going to put my needle on the other intersection point and draw a semicircle a bit further up, like so. And the bisecting line will go from the angle A through, and it should split the angle in half. Okay, that was a tricky one without actual ruler and compass, but if you would like to watch some exam videos on this topic, then click the link here, and let's move on to the next topic. Number six, transformations. There are four transformations you need to know. Reflection, translation, rotation, and enlargement. Let's go through them now. The reflection, you need a line, and you're given that x equals 1. Now, x equals a, for example, these are always going to be vertical. And if y equals a number, let's say b, these are always going to be horizontal. So we need to reflect in this shape, uh, This sorry, reflect this shape in this line. So it's 2 away, so it's going to be 2 on the other side. So the nose will be right here. I can then draw the rest of the shape like such. I need to label that A. 
Next, I've asked to translate. Now, if I'm translating, I need to have a vector. In this case, 5 minus 6. The top line is whether or not we're going right or left if negative. And the bottom line tells us if we're going up or if we're going down if negative. So in this case, it says 5 minus 6. So I take the nose again, and I'm going to go 5 to the right, because it's positive. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I'm going to go down 6, because it's negative. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And now what I can do is draw the shape from the nose. So up here, up here, across, and like that. And I'm going to label that shape with B. And finally, I need to rotate this shape anti-clockwise about the center. So my top tip for this is to draw an L from the nose to the center, and then just think about rotating that L around. So if I rotate that 90 degrees anti-clockwise, then this L shape is going to come down and across like this. So that will be the new nose of the shape. And then I might want to do another uh, point just to make sure. So for example, I might do this point here. That L shape will be down 4 and across 2. Rotating that L shape along, it will be down 2 and then across 4. So this would be the new point here. And I think from there I can draw the shape. And I'm going to connect these two up and then go down here like this. And I'm going to label that shape C. For an enlargement, I need to state three things. First off, I need to state that it is an enlargement. I then need to find the center of enlargement. And I also need to find the scale factor of that enlargement. So in order to find the center, this is the tricky part, you need to find two corresponding vertices. So these two are the same position on both shapes. And then you're going to need to draw a straight line connecting them. And then you're going to have to extend that line on. Something like that. And then you're going to do the same thing for another set of corresponding points. Let's take these two for example. And I'm going to connect them up and then I'm going to extend that line onwards like that. Now where those two cross, that will be your center. So the center of this particular enlargement is 6 along and 7 down, so 6 minus 7. Now the scale factor we can get by just looking at the lengths of the sides. So A is 3 and B is 2. So if I'm mapping A onto B, I need to be doubling my side lengths. So the scale factor in this case is equal to 2. And we're done. Um, click the link at up top to try some exam questions and then we'll move on to the next topic. Okay, number seven, averages and ranges. There are five things that you need to know. You'll need to know how to work out the mean, how to work out the median, how to work out the mode, and the range and the interquartile range. I'm going to use this data set to tell you how to do all five of these. Let's do it. So the mean, I need to do all of the numbers added up. So I'm going to add up all of these numbers. And then I'm going to divide it by the total number of numbers. So in this case, this is going to give me 146 over 11 data entries and this value is 13.27 okay for the median I'm going to need to put the data in order that's really important so I'm going to write it out again 5 7 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 and 18 I can then find the middle number, and because there's an odd number, 11, if I add 1 to it to get 12, divide it by 2, I get 6. So it'll be the sixth number along. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And that's perfectly in the middle, so therefore the median is equal to 14. The mode is the av 
average in which we look at the term which occurs the most frequently. And there's only one term which occurs more than anything else, and that's 18. So 18 is the mode. The range is the largest number minus the smallest number. So it's 18 minus 5, which is equal to 13. And the interquartile range is a bit trickier. Now, once I've got the median, I then look at what's the middle number of the bottom half of the data. Well, the number in the middle there is 11, so that's the lower quartile. And then let's look at the upper half of the data, and the number in the middle there is 17. So that's the upper quartile. And the interquartile range is the upper quartile minus the lower quartile, which is equal to, in this case, 17 minus 11, which is 6. Okay, these questions come up really frequently in the IGCSE. And we need to use the fact that the mean is equal to the total divided by the number of numbers. In this instance, we have that the mean of eight numbers is 41. So that tells me that 41 is equal to the total of those eight numbers divided by eight. So the total of those eight numbers is equal to 41 times 8, which is 248. And now we're told that two of them have a mean of 29. So I can say that 29 is equal to the total of those two numbers divided by 2. So therefore, the total of those two numbers is equal to 29 times 2, which is equal to 58. So how do I work out the mean of the other six numbers? Well, to work out the total of the six numbers, I just have to do the total of those eight minus the total of those two, which is 248 minus 58, which is 190. So the mean of those six numbers is going to equal 190 divided by six, which is equal to... 31.7. Click the link for exam questions and let's try the next topic. A mean from a frequency table. What we need to do is work out the midpoints, multiply them by the frequency, then divide by the total frequency. Okay, let's do it. So the midpoints, I would write a column like this. Uh, 5, 15, 25, 35, 45, and 55. I'll then multiply those by the frequency, which will tell me, on average, how much each row has spent in terms of time. So 5 minutes multiplied by 14 times is 70. 15 times 16 is 240. 25 times uh, 23 is 575. And 35 times 29 is 1,015. And 45 times 12 is 540. And then finally, 55 times 6 is 330. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add up all of those values. And that's going to give me 2,770. Now, here's the top tip. You've got to divide by the total frequency and not the number of rows. I see so many people divide here by six. That's never going to give you the right answer. You've got to divide by the total frequency. So what is the total frequency? Well, that's adding up these numbers here down this row. Uh, column, sorry. And that is 100. So therefore, the mean is equal to 2770 over 100 which is equal to 27.7, which sounds about right because 27.7 is in one of the categories uh, and it's in one of the categories in the middle, which again, it's, it seems about right. You might ask, also be asked to work out the modal class. That's the most frequent class. So that's the one with the highest frequency. In this case, 29 is the highest. So the answer for the modal class will be modal is equal to 30 
to 40. Click the link above to try some exam questions and I will now move on to the next topic. Ratio number nine, it's all about sharing. Let's do it. Okay, so Will and Ollie share 80 pounds in the ratio of three to two. So three plus two is equal to five. That's the number of shares that we have. We take our amount of money and we divide it by five. And that tells us that one share is equal to 16 pounds. So Will, because he is first, has three. So three times 16 is going to be Will's share, which is 48. And two shares for Ollie, which is going to be 32. So Will has 48 and Ollie has 32. Ali and Steve share some sweets in the ratio two to seven and Steve gets 30 more than Ali. Well, in this case, if we're looking at how much more someone has, we need to look at the difference in the number of shares that they have. So Steve has five extra shares because seven minus two is five, and that is equal to 30 sweets. So therefore we can work out that one share is equal to 30 divided by five, which is six. And Steve gets the larger share, he gets seven, so we do seven multiplied by six, and that's gonna give me 42 sweets for Steve. And this is a bit more tricky question, because we've got three people, we've got Al, Tom, and Joe, they share 3,000 um, euros, and the ratio that Al gets to Tom is five to four, and we know that Joe gets 1.5 times the amount Tom gets. So we need to write out a ratio which includes all three of them. So A, T to J. Now we know that the ratio between A and T is five to four, but then what about J? Well, J gets 1.5 times the amount Tom does. So if Tom gets four shares, times that by 1.5, that's gonna give me six. So that's the number of shares that Joe, Joe gets. We can then add our ratios together. We get six plus four plus uh, five is 15 shares we know that that's equal to the total amount of money so we can again try and work out what one share is by doing 3000 divided by 15 and that is 20 uh, sorry 200 and then tom tom is the person who has four shares so tom's stash is 20 multiplied by four, which is 800. And we are done with ratio, exam questions above, and then we'll move on to the next topic. Number 10, standard form. Let's do these examples. 5.12 times 10 to the minus five. I go back one, two, three, four, five. My new decimal point is here, 0 0.0000512. Notice that when you ever you have a negative power, for example, minus five here, you're going to get one, two, three, four, five zeros in your answer. That will happen every time. Next, I need to write this one in standard form. So I start by writing the, the number out. And I always need my number to be between one and 10. So if my decimal point was here, that would give me 5.6, which would be perfect. So how many jumps did I have to do to get there? One, two, three, four, five, six. So this is 5.6 times 10 to the six. Next question, I need to have my uh, numbers all in standard form, then I can compare them. So standard form is a number A times 10 to the power N, where A has to be between one and 10. Now the first one is perfect. 6.1 is between 1 and 10. That's great. The next one, if I want to have it as 6.1, I need to multiply by 10 twice. And in order to keep this balanced, I'll then need to divide by 10 twice. And that will take two powers off the 10. So this will be 6.1 times 10 to the 0. And this next one over here, if I want 6.1, I'm going to have to divide it by 10, 1, 2, 3 times. 
So if I divide it by 10 three times there, I'm going to have to times it by 10 three times on the other side, which is going to add 3 to the power, which is going to give me 6.1 times 10 to the minus 1. So now I can compare them. This one is the biggest, this one is in the middle, and this one is the smallest. Okay, try some exam questions and we'll move on to the next topic. 11 percentages. Now there are lots of different types of percentages questions. I'm going to go through some examples now. This question here, we need to work out what 15% of 540 is. So 15 divided by 100 is 15%, which is 0 0.15. I could do 0 0.15 multiplied by 540, and this gives me 81. I can then take 540 and subtract 81, and this will give me how much Abby has left over to pay. And this is 459. She wants to split them into payments of £17, so I'll need to divide 459 by 17. And that will give me a total of 27 monthly payments. The next question is an increase by 3%. Now, in order to work out percentage increases, I use this formula. I take 100, and then in this case, I'm increasing by 3%, so I add on 3, and then I divide through by 100. And this gives me that the multiplier is 1.03. So what I do next is I take the amount of money, and I multiply it by that increase. And that is going to give me... 35020. Zero, zero. And that is how I do percentage increases. The next question is a percentage decrease. Again, I start with 100, and this time, this time I'm reducing by 20%, so I take away 20, and then I divide that all by 100. This gives me the multiplier of 0 0.8. So I take the amount of money and I multiply it by that multiplier and that is going to give me 29.44 now I might be asked to work out the percentage profit percentage profit is the change divided by the original multiplied by 100 so in this case how much has changed? Well, I could take the new price and subtract the old price. The old price is 21500 and divide that all by the original, which will be the old price. I would then multiply that through by 100. And I would get a cool 6%. And that is the profit. And on to the most common type of question, which is a, re which is a reverse percentage. So in this particular question, it says that the normal price of the book is reduced by 20%, and the sale price of the book is £4.80. So the first thing I'm going to do is work out what the multiplier was that reduced it by 20%. So I take away 20, I divide through by 100, and I get 0 0.8. So the normal price of the book was multiplied by 0 0.8, and that then equaled the new sale price of the book. So to reverse this, I will need to divide by 0 0.8 in order to work out the new price. So I do 4.8 divided by 0 0.8, and I get 6. So the normal price was £6. Okay, here we go. Very similar question, but this time there was an increase of 8%. So an increase of 8% is 100 plus 8 divided by 100, which is 1.08. 
work out the price of the petrol before the increase. So let's call that X and it was multiplied by 0 0.18 and that equaled 1.62. So reversing this tells me that X is equal to 1.62 divided by 1.08, which is equal to one pound 50. Okay, that's percentages done. There's lots of tricky questions uh, in my exam video, so do watch that and then move on to the next topic. Number 12, compound interest. We need to use the formula for this, which is you multiply the amount of money by the multiplier to the power of the number of years. Let's have a go. So this is a savings account, so you're going to gain money. So the multiplier is 100 plus 1.8% 1 all over 100, which is 1.018. We then take the amount of money and multiply it by that multiplier, but we do it to the power of how many years we are in the savings account. So it's to the power of five. And this gives us a value of 10,386 pounds to the nearest pound. Uh, the next question, we have a car which is worth 18,000. And the first year, the value of the car depreciates by 30%. So that multiplier is 100 minus 30 over 100, which is 0 0.7. And then the second and third year, it decreases by 14%. So that's 100 minus 14 over 100, which is 0 0.86. Work out the value of the car after three years. So we take our 18,000 and we multiply it by 0 0.7 for the first year and then 0 0.86 for two years in a row. So we square that. And this gives us a value of 9,318.96 to the nearest penny. Okay, try the exam questions and when you're done, move on to the next topic. Number 13, similar shapes. We need to find two sides which are corresponding. And a way to do that is to look at the angles. Now these two angles here are the same and they point to the same uh, yellow side so therefore those two yellow sides are corresponding. So quite obvious in this example but sometimes it can be a bit tricky. Okay let's um, get into it. So the scale factor I'll always take the larger shape which is 12 and divide it by the smaller shape which in this case is uh, 8 which is 1.5 now it asked me to work out the length of PR PR is this side here and its corresponding side is 26 so I need to multiply it along here to get the uh, the value of PR so I do PR is equal to 26 times by that scale factor and that gives me 39 centimeters the next one we're asked to find is BC BC is this side here, it corresponds to that side there, and if I'm going backwards into the smaller shape, rather than multiplying, I will divide. So I can say that BC is equal to 45 divided by that scale factor of 1.5, and that's equal to 30 centimetres. Okay, try some exam questions, link above, and then move on to the next topic. Number 14, expanding brackets, a real key algebra skill. Let's do these examples. So I will multiply out, I always draw these lines on like this so I know that I'm covering each term inside the bracket. 2x squared times 4x is going to be 8 and x cubed because we have x to the 2 and x to the 1. And when we multiply them, we add the two powers to give you 2 plus 1 is 3. Next, we're going to get minus 2 times 9 is 18. And we've got an x squared there. And we are done on that question. 
Here, I'm going to multiply out these brackets first. 6 times y is 6y. 6 times 3 is 18. And then I'm going to do minus 5 times y, and I'm going to do minus 5 times minus 4. Now, this is what I believe to be the most common mistake GCSE students make. When they multiply out a bracket which has a negative coefficient and a negative inside, they forget the double negative. Let's not make that mistake. So we get minus 5y, and we're going to get plus 20. It asked me also to simplify. How many y's do I have? I've got 6 and minus 5, which makes a total of 1. And how many constants do I have? I've got 18 and 20. That makes a total of 38. Now expanding a double bracket like this, I'm going to use the claw method where I do x times x x times minus 3, 7 times x, and 7 times minus 3, and it makes a little lobster claw. So I'm going to get x times x is x squared, minus 3x, I'm going to get 7 times x, and I'm going to get 7 times minus 3 is minus 21. Then ask me to simplify, so I need to do x squared plus 4x, because minus 3x and 7x makes plus 4, minus 21. Here's another example, same thing, lobster claw, I'm going to get 4 times 2 is 8, and y times y is y squared, 4y times minus 3 is minus 12y, and 3 times 2y is 6y, and 3 times minus 3 is minus 9. Simplify the single y's in the middle, minus 12 plus 6 is minus 6. And finally, you might be asked to expand a triple bracket. Now that we've got a squared here, so this is actually x plus 3, x minus 1, x minus 1. Now if I'm expanding a triple bracket, what I'll do is I will just forget about the first one and just focus on the last two first. I'll do a lobster claw for those two, which will give me x squared minus x minus x plus 1, which is the same as x squared minus 2x plus 1. I'll then reintroduce that green bracket which I left out, which was x plus 3. And then what I'll do is I'll multiply x along the top here by each of these. And that will give me x cubed minus 2x squared plus x, and then I multiply 3 by everything in this bracket here, down the bottom, which will give me 3x squared minus 6x plus 3. It's just a really good way of making sure that you get all six terms come out. Then what I'll do is I will simplify, so x cubes, there's only one of them, x squareds, we've got minus 2 and plus 3, which makes a total of plus 1. X's, we have 1 minus 6, that's a total of minus 5. And then finally, we just have 3 left over as a constant. Okay, try the exam questions and then move on to the next topic. Factorising. Topic number 15. Let's go. So in this instance, there's only a numerical factor, and the highest common factor we could take out is 8. So I write 8 outside the bracket, and then what times by 8 gives me 16q? Well, that's 2q. And what times by 8 gives me 8? That's 1. Make sure that you always include that, that 1 if you've taken out a complete factor. Fully factorised, this implies that you're going to take out a numerical and a algebraic factor. So I can take out a 10 numerically, and I can also take out an A, because they both share an A. What if I got to times 10A by to give 30A squared? I've got to times it by uh, 3A. And what if I got to times 10A by to get 40AB? 
I'm going to times it by 4b. And here we have quadratic factorization. So I need to look at what this number is. That's the most important number. And we need to find two numbers that times together to make 36. And then I need to look at this number here. And they need to also add to make 15. So two numbers that times together to make 36 and add to make 15. Those two numbers are 12 and 3. Once you have those two numbers, you can open up brackets and write a plus 12 and a plus 3. It doesn't matter which way round, because you're multiplying, both would be correct. Okay, once again, we've got this number 36 here. So we need to find two numbers that times to make 36. And we've got this number here, minus 13. Two numbers that add to make minus 13. So those two numbers are, both of them are going to be negative, and we will have negative 9 and negative 4. I know they're both negative because they times to make a positive, but they add to make a negative, so they must both be negative. So then I can just open up a bracket and write x minus 9, x minus 4, and we're done. So more quadratic factorization. In this top left one, this is a difference of two squares. You can spot that by if you have a square minus another square. This will always be equal to a minus b, b, a plus b. So in this case, we can square root x squared to get just x. So that goes in the start of each bracket. We write a minus in one and a plus in the other. And then 16 can be square rooted to make 4. So we write a 4 and a 4. Now this one is a hidden difference of two squares. It doesn't look like it, but when we take out the common factor of 3, we'll get 3x squared minus 4. And we're not quite done there, because it does say factorise fully, and there is another, like I said before, hidden difference of two squares here. So I keep the 3 outside, and the square root of x squared is x, we put a minus in one and a plus in the other, and the square root of 4 is 2. And that is now factorised fully. Okay, this is quadratic factorization where the a term is not 1. And what do I mean by the a term? Well, any quadratic can be written as ax squared plus bx plus c. I now need to find two numbers that times together to make ac, which in this case is 2 times 2, which is 4. And they have to add to make the b term. And in this case, this is 5. So two numbers that times together to make 4 and add to make 5, they are 1 and 4. The next thing I do is I write 2x, 2x, all divided by 2. And the reason why I've put 2 in each of these three places is because the a term is equal to 2. I then put my numbers 1 and 4 inside the brackets. And then the last step is that I need to divide one of these brackets by 2. Well, the one on the right is perfect for dividing by 2. So I write 2x plus 1. Open brackets, divide through by 2 gives me 1x plus 2. And that's it works every time. Let's do another example. I write a, b, c. I need to find two numbers that times to make ac. And ac in this case is 72. 6 times 12 is 72. And they have to add to make b. In this case that's 17. So the two numbers that do that are 8 and 9. I then write 6x 6x all over 6, and all because the a term is 6. I then put my numbers in, plus 8, plus 9. And I try to divide one of these brackets by 6. And we'll notice that we can't divide them by 6. But we could divide one of them by 2 and one of them by 3. Which is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to divide this one by 2 and this one by 3. 
because overall that will be the same as dividing by 6. So dividing the left one by 2 is going to give me 3x plus 4. And dividing the right one by 3 is going to give me 2x plus 3. And we are done. Really important topic this one. I suggest you click the link and try and do some exam questions. And then once you're done, move on to the next topic. Topic 16, linear equations. Really important this one because it feeds into every algebraic topic from henceforth. Okay, let's do the examples. I will need to isolate and work out what the y is. So in order to do that, I'm going to subtract 9 from both sides. This is going to give me 3y is equal to 24 minus 9 is 15. And then I'm going to divide both sides by 3 in order to get 1y, which is equal to 5. Okay, next question. I need to isolate the k. So I'm going to subtract 9 from both sides to remove the k. And that 3 minus 9 is minus 6. And this leaves me with minus 4k on this side. I'm then going to divide both sides by minus 4. And minus 6 divided by minus 4 is 1.5, so that is the value of k. Next question, I'm going to add 5 to both sides. Like such, this is going to remove that minus 5 there. And that's going to give me y over 3 is equal to 9. Now, the inverse operation of dividing by 3, which is what's happened to y, is to multiply by 3. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 3, which is going to remove that divide by 3. And it's going to give me y is equal to 27. Now, this next question is slightly different to the one before because that line is covering the whole of the top here, which says d plus 3. So because it's all been divided by 4, my first step is to multiply by 4. I have to do that first. So I'm timesing both sides by 4. And this is going to give me d plus 3 is equal to 20. And now I'm going to subtract that 3. I can't do that beforehand. I have to do it once that divide by 4 has been removed. And this gives me d is equal to 17. OK, top tip for a question where the variable um, occurs on both sides. Always remove the smallest value of the variable first. OK, let's do it. So the smallest value here is 3x, so I'm going to subtract that first from both sides. This is going to give me 12 on the left is equal to 2x plus 4. I'm then going to subtract 4 from both sides, and this is going to give me 8 is equal to 2x. I'm then going to divide through both sides by 2 to isolate the x, and I get 4 is equal to x, or x is equal to 4 if you prefer. Okay, next question. This is a real classic exam type question. Again, you've got this whole right side divided by 4, so the first thing I'm going to do is multiply both sides by 4. Now, you could introduce a bracket on the left side, but I'm literally just going to times each term by 4. So I'm going to get 16, because 4 times 4 is 16, minus 12x. And timesing by 4 on the right will cancel that divide by 4 on the right, which will just leave you with the numerator of 5 minus x. Now, which is the smallest x? Well, you might say it's minus um, uh, 8, but it wouldn't be technically correct. Minus 12 is smaller. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move that first. I'm going to move the minus 12x by adding 12x to both sides. This will give me 16. And on the right side, I will have 5. And then minus 8 plus 12 is positive 4x. I'm then going to subtract 5 from both sides. And that will give me 11 is equal to 4x. And the final step is to divide through by 4, which will give me a x is equal to 11 over 4. And it's fine to leave your answer as a improper fraction. Okay, 
that's the basics of working through how to solve linear equations but the next examples will show you how to apply them. Okay, so here we have it. We have um, a geometric shape, so a triangle, and it's asking me to work out the value of x. So we're going to need to know that the sum of all of these angles, so if I add up each of the angles like such, it will equal 180, because we know the sum of the angles in a triangle add to 180. Let's collect up the x's before we start solving. We've got 1, 2, and 1, so that makes 4x. And we've got on this side, 13 plus 9 is 22, minus 8 is 14. And that's equal to 180. Subtract 14 from both sides, it's going to give me 166. And then dividing through by 4 is going to give me 41.5. Click the link above to try the exam questions and then move on to the next topic. Topic 17, in uh, qualities on a number line. Here we go, let's do the example. So we have that the circle is hollow, which means that it can't equal 2, and all of the x values are going to the left of that, so they're less than 2. So we write x is less than 2. Here we have that again, we've got a hollow dot at three, and then all the values are to the left of that, and then we've got a filled in dot at minus four. And that means that the x values are in between minus four and three. But because the dot at minus four is shaded, it can equal minus four, so we have to put minus, uh, so we have to put a equal sign underneath the less than sign and here we have that x is to the right so it's greater than it can equal it of minus two okay next one i'm asked to draw a number line so i'll just draw a quick one here and it says n is less than two so i would draw a hollow circle and then a line going to the left now, if y is an integer, so a whole number, and it's in between 4 and 8, then the numbers it could take are 4, 5, 6, 7, but it can't take 8 because it's not equal to 8. And now we're asked to solve this inequality, so I'll write the inequality out. I'll have x's on both sides, so I look for the smallest x, which is just a single x on the right, and I take that away from both sides to give me 3x plus 6 less than or equal to 21. I subtract 6 from both sides, which is going to give me 15, and then I divide through by 3. So I treat it exactly like uh, equals, uh, sorry, exactly like a, uh, a, a equation. Next one, I need to show this on a number line. So the first thing I need to do is to solve it. So I need to subtract 1 from both sides. So I get this. Now I can show it on a number line by drawing a filled in dot at 3 and a line going to the left like that and now I need to work out what particular values y can take first I have to solve it by dividing every term by 2 so I get this and then the whole numbers that are in between 2.5 and 6 are 3, 4, 5 can't be 6 it doesn't equal 6 and then lastly, to solve this equation, I have to be really careful because whenever I have a negative, I should move it to the other side to make it a positive. So I'm going to add 3x to the other side, like this. I'm going to subtract 4, and then I'm going to divide through by 3. Now here's the key point. If ever you have a negative x, if you were to divide or times through by a negative, the inequality sign would switch. So I recommend just moving that negative x to the other side to make it positive and then solving it like a normal equation. Okay, click the link if you want exam questions and then move on to the next topic. Okay, we need to define the region of which this um, shaded region is taking up. So I need to look at each of the lines and I need to work out an equation of the line. 
So the vertical line here, that goes through every point where the x coordinate is minus 2. So that is the line x equals minus 2. This diagonal line here has a gradient of 1, because for every 1 you go across, you need to go up 1 to get to the line. It goes through 0, 0, so that's the line y equals x. And this next line here has a gradient of a half, because for every 1 you go across, you have to go up half to get back to the line. For example, 1 across, half up. And that goes through the y-intercept of 1. So this is y is equal to a half x plus 1. So now I know each of the lines, I've got to figure out whether or not the region is below the line or above the line, or in the case of a vertical line, to the right or to the left. So let's look at the vertical line first, and you can see that the region is to the right of that. So therefore, I'm going to write that x needs to be greater than or equal to minus 2. Let's, and that was this vertical line here. Let's now look at this um, line going across like this. Now, is the region above or below? Well, it's above, so therefore I write y is greater than or equal to x, because it's above. And then finally, we look at this line here, and we ask, is it below or above? Well, it's below that red line, so in this case we write y is less than or equal to a half x plus 1. Oops, sorry, a half x plus 1. These are all equal to signs because all of these lines on this region were filled in. If they were dotted, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't write equal to, you'd just write less than or greater than. Okay, link to exam questions above. Let's move on to the next topic. Simultaneous equations, absolute classic GCSE skill. You've got to master this because it's easy marks. Okay, here we go. Here's the examples. Uh, first one, the coefficients are lined up perfectly. Uh, so we don't need to do any multiplying. The signs are different. And when the signs are different, we add the two equations. When the signs are the same, we minus the two equations. So really important you know that. Okay, signs are different, we add the equation. So we just write a plus sign there, a line there, and we get 4 plus 1 is equal to 5x. We get these two will cancel out perfectly, and we'll get 18 plus 7 is 25. Divide through by 5 gives us x is equal to 5. Then pick one of the two equations. I always like to pick the one without a minus sign. And then substitute in x is equal to 5. So the top line now becomes 4 times 5 plus 3y equals 18. So 20 plus 3y equals 18. So 3y is equal to minus 2. So y is equal to minus 2 over 3. Next example. Again, we've got these two matched up perfectly. So we don't need to do any timesing. And we have those, those two have the same sign, they're both positive, so we need to minus the two equations. So 2x minus 2x gives me a cancellation. 5y minus minus y, to be careful about that, that gives me 6y. Minus 10 minus 8 gives me minus 18. Dividing through by 6, I get y is equal to minus 3. I'm going to pick the top one because it doesn't have a minus sign in again. And I'm going to get 2x plus 5 lots of minus 3 is equal to minus 10. So 2x, 5 times minus 3 is minus 15. Add the 15 to both sides. It's going to give me 5 on the right. This is going to give me 2.5 for x. And the final example is when we do need to multiply. And this time we need to multiply both equations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the top one by 3 and the bottom one by 2. You could do 2 and 5, but I'm going to line up the y's because the signs are different, which means we need to add the equations, which I think is slightly easier. 
Okay, this is going to give me 6x plus 6y is equal to 42. Times it by 2 on the bottom is going to give me 10x minus 6y is equal to 38. I'm going to add the two equations because the signs are different. It'll give me 16x is equal to 80. So dividing through by 16 gives me x is equal to 5. Okay, now we need to substitute back in. I'm going to pick the top one and we're going to do 2 times 5 plus 2y is equal to 14. So 10 plus 2y is equal to 14. So 2y is equal to 4 when I subtract 10, which means that y is equal to 2. Okay, try the exam questions. Click the link above. Uh, the one at the end is really tricky. You've got to create the simultaneous equation yourself, so I recommend doing that. And then let's move on to the next topic. Number 20, indices. Really key algebraic skill. I've written the indice laws down the side. I'm not going to go through them, but you need to know all of them. Okay, here are the examples. First one, we can multiply 2 and 5, and that will give us 10. And then a bit of a trick question, actually, because we've got M and we've got an N. Now, when we multiply them, we can't do any indice powers unless the bases are the same. And M and N are different. So it's just M squared N to the 6. Okay, next one. We can divide 15 by 3 to get 5. And this time, because the bases are the same, we can use our indice rules. So P to the 3 divided by P to the 4 we would subtract the powers, so 3 minus 4 is minus 1, so it's p to the minus 1, which can also be written as 5 over p, because a negative power means we take the reciprocal of that variable. Okay, next one, we've got brackets. So we need to do 4 to the power of 3, which is 64. We then need to do a to the power of 3, which is just a to the 3 and then we do b squared to the power 3 and when we have this power and then a bracket and then a power we multiply them to get b to the power of 6. Over here we're dividing so we've got 16 divided by 4 which is 4. We've then got m to the 7 divided by m to the 3 and when we divide we subtract the powers so 7 minus 3 is 4 and then here we have m to the 3 over m to the 1, subtract the powers, give us m to the 2. Okay, we're up in the difficulty here. It says write the fourth root of 2 to the power of 5 as a power of 2. So first off, 8 can be written as 2 to the power of 3. And we are taking the fourth root, which means as a fraction, we can write that as to the power of 1 over 4. And then we're taking that to the power of 5. Now what do we do when we have these brackets lined up and powers ascending like this? We just multiply the powers together. So we have 3 times a quarter times by 5, which is going to give me 15 over 4. So it's 15 over 4. Okay, here we have um, lots of different a's multiplied together. We've got the cube root of a to the 4. So we write a to the 4 and the cube root means we take the third power. Again any root we write it as a fractional power so the cube root is the third power and then we're multiplying that by 1 over a and we can write that as a to the minus 1 because when we have 1 over the reciprocal that's the same as the negative power and a on the bottom is just a to the power 1. Right, now we need to multiply these bracket powers like this. So that's going to give me 4 over 3. And then what happens when we multiply a's together? Well, we add the powers. So 4 over 3 plus 1. Oh, sorry, plus minus 1. is going to give me a to the 1 third. Because 4 over 3 minus 1 is 1 over 3. And here we have quite a challenging question. We've got lots to do here. So the first thing I would do is I will look at the over 4 in the power. 
So that means I need to take the fourth root. So if I take the fourth root of each of these, well, the fourth root of 16 is 2, because 2 to the power of 4 is 16. Now, if I take the fourth root of w to the 8, well, I just need to multiply a quarter by 8, which is going to give me 2. And then if I take the fourth root of y to the 20, again, I just multiply 20 by a quarter, which is 5. Okay, so I've got rid of the quarter power. I've still got minus 3 um, as the power. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cube. I'm going to cube everything. And 2 cubed is going to give me 8. W squared cubed will give me W to the 6. And Y to the 5 cubed will give me Y to the 15. But I've still got this negative power here. And what does the negative power do? It takes the reciprocal or in other words it flips a fraction over so i'll just flip it over and i'd have my final answer okay that's a crash course in indices i recommend watching the video of the exam questions and we will now move on to the next topic okay we have uh, number 21 speed density and pressure so for these topics i recommend triangle really important and really useful. Uh, I'll show you what I mean in these examples. So this is a speed question. So I'm going to draw the speed triangle. And this is speed, distance and time. A car travels this distance in this time. Work out the average speed. So they asked me to find the average speed. I cover speed, which means I have to do distance divided by time because d is on top of the t so the speed is distance over time the distance is 230 and the time is four hours 15 minutes which is four hours and a quarter of an hour so it's 4.25 is what i need to type in this gives me 554 one to one decimal place perfect next question is a uh, volume mass and density question again i'm going to want a triangle here and density mass volume is the triangle for this one it's asking me to work out the volume of the rock so i cover the volume and that tells me i have to do the mass divided by the density so i write volume is equal to mass divided by density the mass is 56 grams. The density, which is in terms of grams, so we don't need to do any conversions, is 3.5. And this gives me a value of 16. And because the density is in centimetres cubed, this will be centimetres cubed. And the triangle for pressure is pressure force area. And in this case, they're asking me to work out the pressure. So I cover P, and that tells me I need to do force divided by area. So I do pressure is equal to force over area. In this case, it's 120 over 2. So that is going to give me 60. And that will be newtons per meters squared. Link to exam questions above, and when you're ready, let's move on to the next topic. 22 is angles. There's quite a lot to know, so what I'm going to do is just do a quick summary of which uh, parallel line angles you need to know. So here we go. So first one are opposite angles. So we have 110 there, so B is equal to 110 because it's opposite. So we can say the opposite angles are equal you can also remember this because they kind of form a z an x sorry okay next one we have that 110 is the same as d down here and that's because d is equal to 110 and that's because alternate angles are equal 
Now, alternate angles make a sort of Z shape. So in this case, we have coming in here like this, we've got this Z type shape. And it's the same as well if you, for example, C will be the same as G because of this Z shape here. Okay, the next one we need to know is that 110 is the same as F. So we can say here that F is equal to 110, and this is called corresponding angles. Sorry, corresponding angles are equal, and these make a sort of F shape. So if I was to draw in purple here, a line coming down covering that 110 angle, and a line coming down covering that F angle there, you can see this sort of reverse F shape on that side. Or, by the similar token, C will be the same as E, because again, they form this F type shape. And then finally, the last one is uh, 110 will be the, uh, and G, that forms a C type shape, and those two are cor corinterior angles, and corinterior angles add up to 180. So in this case, G would equal 70, and that's because co-interior angles add to 180, and they make a C-type shape. Okay, so those are the four parallel line rules which you need to know. And here's an example where we can apply all of that. So... We also need to know that angles on a straight line add up to 180. So that means this angle in here must be 70. We also need to know that when we see these lines here, it means that this triangle is isosceles, and it means these two angles are the same. So this is 70 because that is 70. And then we also need to know that angles in a triangle add up to 180. And that is going to tell us that this purple angle down here is equal to well, 70 plus 70 is 140 so 40 is left over to make 180 and finally how can we work out what this angle down the bottom is here let's label this green angle here well we can see this Z shape which has been made with the 70 at the top so therefore those two are alternate which means that the green angle in there is also 70 degrees Okay, exam questions, link above. Let's move on to the next topic. Here we have angles in polygons, and I've written the key important formulas which you have to memorize in the top right there. And let's get on to the question. So work out the size of an exterior angle in a regular hexagon. Well, we can see here from the second uh, formula, the exterior angle is 360 divided by the number of sides. So if I was to find the exterior angle here, I would do 360. Hexagon has six sides, so the answer is 60. The next one says work out the size of each interior angle of a regular octagon. Well, I always find it's easier to work out the exterior first. So the exterior of an octagon will be 360 over 8, which is 45. And then we can use the third rule here, that the interior and the exterior add to make 180. So the interior plus 45 was the exterior equals 180. So then the interior is equal to 180 minus 45, which is 135. The size of... Of each exterior angle in a radical polygon is 20. So how many sides it has? We're going to reverse engineer this second formula here. So the exterior angle is 20 and that's equal to 360 over the number of sides. Multiplying both sides by n give me 20n is equal to 360 and then dividing both sides by 20 gives me 360 over 20. So in essence, we just divide 360 by the exterior angle. We get the number of sides, in this case, 18. So here we have a question in context. We've got three shapes, a triangle and an octagon, 
and it's asking me to work out how many sides polygon P has. Well, first off, we can work out this angle here, and that's a triangle, and we know the interior angles of a triangle, or of a regular triangle, should I say, are 60. We can work out the interior angle of the octagon, which we actually just did on the last question, and that was 135. And that tells me then what the interior angle is of the shape P. So it will be 360 around that point, minus 135, minus 60, and that will be 165. So that's the interior angle. And I can then work out its exterior angle because interiors and exteriors are always adding to 180. So 180 minus 165 is equal to 15. And once you have the exterior, you can work out the number of sides because the number of sides is equal to 360 divided by the exterior angle. So in this case, that's 360 divided by 15. And that's gonna give me an answer of 24. Link for the exam questions, and let's move on to the next topic. 24, bearings. So bearings, there are three things that you need to remember. That is that they are measured always from north, they're always measured clockwise, and they are always given in three figures. Okay, let's do this question. So find the bearing of A from B. Well, I need a protractor for this, and because it's from B, I need to go all the way around here. So I would measure this angle in here, and let's say for the purpose of this video it's 120. Then the bearing is clockwise from north all the way around, so it's 360 minus, which would be 240. Now we're asked to plot point C, 450 meters on a bearing of 150. So I'll put my protractor up along the north line so that zero was north. I would then measure an angle around of 150, which would be roughly to there. And then I would draw a line through that angle down like this. I would then use the scale to measure however far 450 meters was, and then I would come to my point C right here, and I'll be done. And that's bearings done. Okay, Pythagoras, number 25. We need to know the formula, which is that A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared, and then we should be good to go. So, the first question asked me to work out the hypotenuse which are label C. The other two sides can be A and B, doesn't matter which, because we're going to do 4.2 squared plus 5.6 squared is equal to C squared, and then to find C we're going to square root the whole of these two squared added together. And that will give me a value of 7. Lovely. And next, we need to work out the short side. So let's label this one A, this one B, and this one C. And let's write out the formula again. So A squared, which is 6 squared, plus B squared, we don't know, is equal to C squared. And in this case, because we're looking for the shorter side, I need to subtract that 6 squared over to the right side and then to work out B, I will square root 14 squared minus 6 squared. And that gives me an answer of 12.6. And we are done. Okay, uh, exam questions above. Let's move on to the next topic. Trigonometry. It's all about Sokotoa, and it's all about, in my opinion, writing down these three triangles. Sok ka and toa if you write the triangles down then all you need to do is just cover up what you're looking for and it makes it means there's no algebra involved in to solve these types of questions we also need to make sure we know which side is which so opposite is opposite the angle adjacent is next to it and hypotenuse is the longest one 
Okay, let's get into it. So the opposite is opposite the angle. That's a terrible arrow, but you get the picture. That's opposite. And the hypotenuse is always opposite the uh, right angle. And the adjacent is down here, but we don't need the adjacent this time round because we're looking for H and we have the opposite. So therefore we're going to be using um, the sine. So I draw out my triangle and I'd write S O H. I'm looking for H, which means I cover H, which means to work it out, I need to do the opposite divided by the sine of the angle. So I write H is equal to O over sine of the angle. So X is equal to 20 over sine of 35. And this gives me 36.9. Next one, identify that this is the opposite. This is the hypotenuse, and therefore this is the adjacent. I have, uh, I'm looking for the opposite, and I have the adjacent. So therefore, I'm going to use uh, the function tan. So I write tan of the angle and O over A. Because I'm looking for the opposite, I cover that. And that tells me that I need to multiply the two down the bottom. So I would write that the opposite is equal to tan of the angle times by A. So in this case, X is equal to tan of 42 times by 11. And we put that into our calculator and we get 9.90. And now we need to work out the angle rather than the side, but we use the same uh, logic. So this is the opposite. This is opposite the um, right angle, so that's the hypotenuse. And this is the adjacent. In this case, I have the hypotenuse and the adjacent, and I'm actually looking for the angle. So A and H means cosine. So I draw my cosine triangle, which is cosine of the angle is A over H. This time I'm looking for the angle, so I've got to cover the cosine of the angle. So I write cosine of the angle is A over H. So I write cosine of X is equal to 16 over 24. And then to get X, I need to do the inverse of cosine, which is cosine to the minus one of 16 over 24. And this gives me a value of 48.2. And we're done. Link to exam questions. Let's move on to the next topic. 27 is area and perimeter. I've put all the key formula that you need to know up in the top right. The one which you are given is the trapezium, but it's important to commit all of them to memory, I would say. Okay, let's get on to these questions. We have a triangle and a parallelogram, and it's asking me to work out the height of the parallelogram, given that the parallelogram is four times the area of the triangle. So let's first work out the area of the triangle. It will be seven times four halved, which is going to be 14. And the area of the parallelogram is base, which is 14 times by height. So because the area of the parallelogram is four times bigger than the area of the triangle, I'm gonna to have to take the area of the triangle and times it by four in order to make it equal the area of the parallelogram. So this is going to give me 56 is equal to 14 times by h. Dividing through, I'm going to get h is equal to 4. So the height is equal to 4. Okay, we need to just use the trapezium um, equation for this. So the area is equal to 1 half. Now a and b represent the two parallel sides. So A and B here, doesn't matter which way round, but those two are parallel to one another. So those are the A's and the B's. We add those together, so that's 5 plus 10. And then the height always represents the gap between the two parallel sides. So in this case, 7. 
So we have a half of 15 times by 7, which gives us 52.5. Uh, next question, we're looking at circles, and we have a semicircle here, and it has an area of 50. So we know the area for a circle is pi r squared, but because it's a semicircle, we're going to have to split that in two, so divide it by two, and that's equal to 50. So if I'm going to want to work out the perimeter, I'm going to need to reverse engineer this in order to work out the radius. So I times both sides by 2. I'm then going to divide by pi. And I'm then going to square root to get my value for the radius. And this gives me 5.64. Okay, now to work out the perimeter. Well, the perimeter is the distance all the way around the shape. So, so far, all I know is from there to there is 5.64. So, let me work out the circumference, which is 2 pi r. But again, I'm going to need only half of that. So, I just need this part. So, I'm going to divide that by 2. And that is going to give me... 17.7 okay so the total perimeter is going to be the arc which is 17.7 plus the radius plus another radius and that will take me all the way around the shape so we have the arc there we have a radius and we have another radius to make me uh, to complete the shape and this gives me 29.0 meters. Exam questions above. I'm going to move on to the next topic. Volume and surface area, number 28. I've got a triangular prism here, and I'm going to work out the volume of it, and I'm also going to work out the surface area of it. Okay, let's go. So the volume, we need to work out first off the area of the cross section which is this area here. It's this triangle which goes all the way back through the shape. So the area of the cross-section, I'm going to call the cross-sectional area, is equal to 5 times 12 divided by 2, because it's a triangle, which is going to give me 30. Okay, so the volume is the cross-sectional area multiplied by whatever dimension you're pushing that shape back into. In this case, the sort of uh, depth, I guess, or the length. So I'm going to multiply that by 10 here. So I'm going to get 30 multiplied by 10, which is 300 meters, or sorry, centimeters cubed because it is volume. Okay, now I need to work out the surface area, which is the total area of all of, in this case, the five surfaces. So I've already worked out the area of the triangle. I'm going to call that um, face A. I know that's equal to 30. And then I know that there's a face on the back, which is exactly the same. So B is equal to 30. I'm then going to look at the base. I'm going to call that C. And that will be 12 times 10, which is 120. I'm then going to look at the side over here. I'm going to call that D. And that's 10 by 5. So that's 50. And then finally, I'm going to look at the slope side. I'm going to call that E, so that's the slope face right here, and that will be 10 long and 13 wide. So that's 10 times 13, which is 130. So the total surface area is equal to all of these added up, which is 360, and that will be centimetres squared because it is an area. Next example, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to work out the volume and the surface area. Okay, so the volume, I'm going to need the cross-sectional area again. And that's the area which is pushed all the way through the shape. And in this case, it is that circle. So that's going to equal pi r squared. So we're going to do pi multiplied by the radius being half the diameter, which is 25 squared. So I get an answer of 6 to 5 pi. And of course, I could work out a decimal, but let's just leave it in exact form. Okay, now I need to work out the surface area. 
So the volume is the cross-sectional area multiplied through by the dimension which you push it in, which in this case is the height. So this cross-sectional area is 625 pi, and I'm multiplying that by 1.5. But wait, I have to be very careful here, because the units are different. So we were using centimetres, and this is not in centimetres, so I need to convert it into centimetres, which is 150. And this gives me a value of 93750 pi, and that will be centimetres cubed. Okay, now I need to work out the surface area of this shape. Well, the surfaces we have are a, a lid, and then we're also going to have the base down the bottom as well. So the value, uh, sorry, the area of the, the circle, again, is pi r squared, which we've already worked out to be 6 to 5 pi. And we're going to have two of those, because we've got the base and we've got the lid. And in order for us to work out the curved surface area, I need to unravel this wrapped up can of beans, if you were. So I'm going to have 150 centimetres along as the height. And then as I unravel it, it's going to create a rectangle. And that rectangle, the length of that rectangle is all the way around the circle. So that's the circumference, which is 2 times pi times by r, which is 25. So that's 50 pi. So in order for me to work out the curved surface area, let's call it b, I need to do 50 pi, which is the circumference, multiplied by the height, which is 150. This gives me 7 thousand five hundred pi so the total surface area is going to be a six two five pi plus another six two five pi plus seven five zero zero pi and this is eight seven five zero pi in total okay um, click the link for some exam questions and then we're going to move on to the next topic here we go community frequency the most common question on the IGCC I've looked at all the exam papers this one comes up more frequently than any other topic and it is easy marks so let's go get them Right, first we need to do is work out the community frequency, and it's a running total. So we start with uh, 8, and then we add on 10, so it's 18, and then we add on uh, 21, so that gives me 39. We add on 19, which gives me uh, 58. We add on 13, which gives me um, 71, and then we add on 9, we get 80. Okay. Top tip, they will give you the number of people in the question and you want to make sure that your community frequency adds to that number at the end. Okay, now second top tip, actually we need to make sure that we plot on the x-axis these numbers here, the endpoints. So the first plot I do is 1 and 8, which is about there, and then 2 and 18, which is there. 3 and 19, uh, sorry, 3 and 39, which is there. 4 is 58, which is there. And uh, 5 is 71. And then finally, 6 is 80. We then connect it up with a nice smooth curve, like such. And then we maybe ask certain questions. For example, a common one is work out the median. Well, there are 80 people. So the median happens after the 40th person, the halfway point. You go down here, you go along, and you've got roughly just over three um, kilograms. And you might also be asked for the interquartile range. That's another common question. So in this case, you take the 80, you divide it by four to get a quarter, 
which is 20 in this case. You go along and you go down. So that looks like the lower quartile is about 2.2. And then we go at the free quarter mark. So divide 80 by 4 to get 20, times it by 3, we get 60. Of course, in your exam, you're going to use a lovely ruler and take your time. I'm rushing a little bit, but you get the idea. That's 4.3. So the interquartile range is the upper quartile minus the lower quartile. In this case, that's going to give you 2.1. And finally, they might ask you to say how many people are over... Um, or how, how many packages in this case are over five kilograms. So you'd go up from five kilograms, you would go across and you would get about 72 people less than five. So there would be answer that the number of people greater than five would be eight. Okay. Um, try the exam questions because this question will always come up and you want to make sure that you can do them every single time and let's go on to the next topic number 30 equation of a straight line you need to know that y is equal to mx plus c where m is the gradient and c is the intercept and you also need to know to work out how how to work out a gradient which is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 okay we have we're given the gradient and we're given that it passes through 0 4 which is the y intercept so therefore, the equation of the line is y is equal to the gradient, which we're told is 2, x plus 4, because we know it goes through the point 0, 4, which is right here on the y-axis, so that's the y-intercept. Okay, next question. Okay, we've got a line here, and we need to work out the gradient in order to work out this equation of the straight line. Right, so let's do this then. So the way that I work out the gradient is I pick a point and I go one to the right and then I ask myself the question, how do I get back to the line by going up or down? Well, the only way to get back to the line by going up or down is to go down here. And how far would I have gone down? I would have gone down two. So the gradient is minus two because I'm going down by two. So I can write y is equal to minus two x and then what is the y-intercept? Well, that's where it crosses the y-axis, and it crosses there at positive 5. Okay, we've got lots of lines here, but no numbers. And we've been asked to work out which one is which. Well, I can see that there is only one horizontal line. And that horizontal line is Q. And horizontal lines are always of the form y equals. So therefore, q must be this one, d. And we have two other lines which go through 3 on the y-axis. So they must have a y-intercept. We have the blue line there, and we have the green line here. Now, the blue line has got a positive gradient, because as you go from left to right, it rises up. So I'm looking for something that goes through 3 and has a positive gradient. So that must be C. Now, the green line also goes through 3 on the y-axis, but it has a negative gradient. Because as you go from left to right along it, you'll be going down. So therefore, that must be one with a negative gradient. Here, you can see minus 2x means it's negative. And the last one is the pink line here. And it must be y equals 2x. It has no y-intercept. It goes through the origin. Okay, you might get an equation which is not in the perfect form. You need to rearrange it in order to work out those key bits of information, the gradient and the intercept. So I will rearrange this by writing 2y is equal to plusing 10x to both sides. Gives me this. And then dividing through by 2 so that I get y equals, which is what I want. And now it's in the perfect form. I can work out that the gradient must be 5. Now, top tip, lots of people write 5x for the gradient. That's not correct. It must be just the number because a gradient is constant on a straight line. So you can't put an x in as well. Unfortunately, you wouldn't get the mark there. Okay, uh, part B is asking me for an, write down the equation of a line parallel to this line. 
So if it's parallel, it has the same gradient. So it'd be y equals 5x. And then we can add on literally anything or take away anything. We can just change the y-intercept and that will give me a, a parallel line. As long as it's not plus 4 because that would be the same line. Okay. We have now two points. And with two points, we can work out the gradient between them. So I'm going to call this one the 1s and this one the 2s. And then I'm going to follow the formula that I've got up here, that m, the gradient, is equal to y2. So that's the y value of the 2s, which is minus 3. Minus y1, that's the y value of the blues, which is 1. All over x2, which is the x value of the, of the yellows, which is 3. And minus y1, which is the x value of the blue. This gives me minus 4 on top and we have minus 5 on the bottom, so this is 4 over 5. And we might go one step further because quite likely you'll be asked to work out the equation of a line given the um, given the given two points. So what we could do is we could write out y equals mx plus c and we can sub in one of our points and the gradient we've already worked out. So if I sub in this one, I get the y value is 1, the gradient is 4 over 5, and the x value is 8 plus c. This gives me that 1 is equal to 32 over 5 plus c. So therefore c is equal to 1 minus 32 over 5. And 1 is 5 over 5. So this tells me that C must equal minus 27 over 5. And great, we've now got C and we've now got M. So our equation for this line would be 4 over 5x minus 27 over 5. Okay, click the link to try some exam questions and we're going to move on to the next topic. Sketching graphs. Um, there is a great function on your calculator called the table function, which makes it really easy to do tables like this. I don't have my calculator at the moment, but if you do click the link at the end of this video, the exam questions I do will involve a calculator so you can see how to use the table function. Okay, let's do this then. So what I need to do is take each of these numbers, square them, plus it to itself, and then minus 6. So minus 3 squared is 9, and then add on a minus 3 gives me 6, then minus 6 gives me 0. Minus 2 squared is 4, minus 2 is 2, minus 6 is minus 4, minus 1 squared is 1, minus 1 is 0, and then minus 6. 1 squared is going to give me... 1 plus 1 is 2, minus 6 is minus 4, and we should see some nice symmetry here because it's a quadratic, which we do, and we have 3 squared is 9, plus 3 is 12, minus 6 is 6. I then need to um, draw that line, uh, draw that curve, so at the x value of minus 3, we have 0, at minus 2, we have minus 4, at minus 1, we have minus 6, 0, we have minus 6, 1, we have minus 4, 3, uh, sorry, 2, we have 0, and 3, we have 6. So we're going to get a lovely quadratic, and it's not going to have a flat bottom. It's going to come down and be symmetrical, so it's going to dip right halfway between those two points, and it's going to come up like that, and we've drawn a perfect quadratic graph. It then says use the graph to find the estimates of the solution x squared plus x minus 6 is equal to minus 2. Well, we already have this part sorted. That's already drawn for us. We've already drawn y equals x squared plus x minus 6. So what we need to do is draw this side of the equation. y is equal to minus 2. And that's a horizontal line that goes through minus 2. So it looks like that. And because y is equal to both of these two, then where these two cross will give me the solution to this equation here. So we need to find the x-coordinates of where they cross. So I go up here, 
and that's roughly about minus 2.6 and then we go up here which is roughly about 1.6 and remember it does say estimate so you can be uh, you don't have to be exact but obviously as accurate as you could possibly be okay we've got lots of different graphs here and we've got to match them up so the first one is a linear graph it has no squares or cubes uh, or any uh, 1 over x's so it's just a straight line graph and it's got a positive gradient of 3 so it must be this one because this one would have a negative gradient okay so yellow is this one next we've got a quadratic which is going to give me a u shape and we've got a couple of u shapes here for us to pick from and because it's a positive x squared it's going to have a u shape so like this one or like this one there's actually a tricky question to decide which one is which it's actually going to be this one here because it has a negative root and a positive root and I know that this one is going to have a negative and a positive root because if I were to factorize this which I'll do quickly 2x x minus 3 and plus 1 it will have one positive root here at 3 and one negative root here at minus a half whereas this graph down the bottom here has two negative ones that was quite tricky okay the next one is a reciprocal graph and reciprocal graphs take this shape here where it curves down there and it curves over here this one is also reciprocal, but this is negative. That would be uh, y is equal to negative something over x. And we are done. Okay, try the exam questions. There are some tricky ones on there where you need to rearrange some um, algebraic equations and then plot a particular line in order to solve them. Those are really quite challenging, so give those a go. Okay, GCSE maths means quadratics. So you've got to be able to factorize them. You've got to be able to solve them. Let's get into it. We have uh, an, a C term of 20. So two numbers that times to make 20. And they must add to make um, 9. So they must add to make 9. Whoops, 9. So those two numbers are 4 and 5. So you have B plus 4 and B plus 5. That equals 0. And that means that one of these two brackets must equal zero, because that's the only way we're going to get a zero when we times two things together, which means that b must equal minus four, or b must equal minus five. Uh, let's have a look at this next one. We've got two numbers that times together to make nine, and they've got to add together to make negative ten. Okay, those two numbers must be um, minus one and minus nine. Again, that equals zero, so one of these brackets must equal zero. So either y is equal to one or y is equal to nine. Our next question, we can factorize this using the AC method. So I need two numbers that times together to make AC, where AC in this case is three times 10, which is 30. And I need two numbers that add to make the B value which is 17. So those two numbers are 2 and 15. Because the a value is 3, I write 3x, 3x all over 3, and we put in the 2 and the 15. So we have 3x plus 2, or x plus 5, when I divide that bracket by 3. So either 3x plus 2 equals 0, or x plus 5 equals 0. And I can solve this one by minusing 2, and then dividing through by 3. And I can solve this one just by minusing 5. And there we have it. And we may also need to use the quadratic formula. I've got it written down here. It's given in your formula booklet. And how do we use it? Well, we label a, b, and c, the terms of a quadratic. We then substitute into the formula. So we have here minus b, which is 5. Then I'd always recommend putting this inside a bracket like that, 
in case it's a negative and your calculator might make a mistake. And then minus 4 multiplied by A is 1 multiplied by C is 3. And that's all over 2 times 1. Great. And then what I would do is I would recommend simplifying down inside the square root. Just helps with method marks. 25 minus 12 is 13. And that's all over 2. And that's going to give me two answers of minus 0 0.70 and minus 4.30. Uh, next one is similar, but we're asked to give our answers in third forms. So ABC, again, we have X is equal to minus minus 4, plus minus the square root of, again, make sure you put it inside brackets so your calculator doesn't mess up, and then minus 4 times by 1 times by minus 1. And that's all over... 2 times 1. Okay, simplifying, I'm going to get uh, 4 plus or minus the square root of 16 minus times a minus is a plus, so 16 plus 4 is 20. And that's all over 2. I've been asked to simplify, um, and I can simplify that third. So root 20 is the same as root 4 times root 5. And that's useful because I can now divide everything by 2. So I get x is equal to 4 divided by 2 is just 2. Root 4 is 2. And if I divide it by 2, they will cancel. So I'm just left with root 5. So it's plus or minus root 5. Perfect. Okay, give the exam questions a go. And I'm going to move on now to the next topic. So we start by factorising two numbers at times together to give minus 24 and add to get minus 5 are minus 8 and positive 3. We say that's greater than 0. But we imagine if it was 0, then this would give me x values of 8 and x values and x value of minus 3. We then sketch the graph, so it's going to cross at minus 3 and it's going to cross at 8. So it's quadratic, so we're going to get this U-shape like so. And then we ask ourselves the question, when is that quadratic? When does it give you values greater than zero? Well, it does over here, and it does over here. And we need to write that as an inequality. So we get these greater than zero values, any x value which is less than minus 3, to the left of minus 3, and any x value which is to the right of 8, so greater than 8. And that is how you solve a quadratic inequality. Okay, let's look at this next one. It's really tempting just to square root straight away and say the answer is 10 or minus 10. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to minus the 100 over. I'm then going to factorize using difference of two squares to get minus 10 and plus 10. And then, yes, the x values that equal 0 are 10 and minus 10. And we can draw a graph to show that by cutting here at minus 10 and at plus 10. And we're going to get this shape here. Now, the question asks us to find the values which are less than or equal to 0. So that's where the curve dips below the x-axis. And we write that... Um, inequality, which is bounded between minus 10 and 10, as minus 10 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 10. And there we have it. Okay, um, watch the exam questions because I show you a way of using your calculator to get to the answer uh, really quickly and to check. So that's really useful. And then let's move on to the next topic. Okay, probability 2, uh, also known as uh, tree diagrams. So Hannah is going to play one game of chess and one game of backgammon. The probability she will win one game of chess is 0.6, and the probability she'll win one game of backgammon is 0.7. Draw a tree diagram to represent this data. Okay, so we draw a little um, two set of branches here. And the first one is chess, and there's only two outcomes here. Um, well, she either wins or she doesn't win. 
I'm not going to put loss because she could draw. So I'm going to put win dash, which means she doesn't win. And the chance of her winning is 0 0.6. And the chance of her not winning is 0 0.4 because they have to add up to 1. And then what we're going to do next is going to draw two branches stemming from each of those possibilities. And this will be our backgammon branch. And we have win. Again, not win win and not win and this is 0.7 and 0.3 must be the chance of her not winning because they must add up to one and we write that in both of those sections now work out the probability hannah will win both games so all we need to do is go down the branch where she wins both so we say the probability of her winning and then winning again is equal to 0.6 times 0.7 and I'm timesing because I said the word and I said winning and then winning again which means I need to multiply the probabilities and I get 0 0.42 okay next question uh, Brandy gets the bus Saturday Sunday the probability the bus is late on any day is 0.2 so draw a tree diagram to represent that so this is a fairly straightforward one so we have Saturday we have Sunday, we have um, late and not late, late, not late, late, not late. So late is 0 0.2, not late therefore is 0 0.8. And we can fill in these probabilities which don't change because the apparently it's independent of what the day is. And then it says is at late on at least one of these days. Well, let's draw all the branches which give us at least one late. Well, two lates is at least one. A late and a not late is at least one. A not late and a late is at least one. And the only one which is not is if they're not late on both times. So I can go along and I can work out the probability of each branch by multiplying 0.2 times 0.2 is 0 0.04 point 0.2 times point 0.8 is 0 0.16 point 0.8 times point 0.2 is 0 0.16 and then finally point 0.8 times point 0.8 is 0 0.64 now we want the blue ones because we want at least one so the probability of um, at least one at least one L is adding all of those up because any of those will give me success either or and whenever I see the word or in probability we add so we get 0.04 plus 0 0.016 plus 0 0.016 and that gives me 0 0.36 there is a quicker way of doing it we could just do 1 minus the pink line which is 0 0.64 because that is the probability that they are on time both times which is exactly what we don't want so we can always do one minus what we don't want to get what we do want okay uh, exam questions above there are some more tricky questions on this topic so I would recommend doing the exam questions because you could also have um, a conditional probability where the probability changes from each branch and there's also some really tricky sort of algebra type questions towards the end as well. So give those a go and then let's move on to the next. Okay, number 35, bounds. I see lots of students get these questions wrong. I've got a surefire method which works every time. Let me show you what it is. Um, so I'm going to look first at each of the numbers. So I'm going to start with A. And A is 6. And that's correct to the nearest integer. So I think to myself, well, what's the next integer above? Well, that would be 7. And the one below would be 5. And the upper bound is halfway between these two. And the lower bound is halfway between those two. And that's it. That gives you the upper bound and the lower bound every time. So let's do it for B as well. So B, we put 15 in the middle. And then correct to the nearest 5. So if I'm going up in 5s, the next number would be 20. And if I was going down, it would be 10. And then the lower bound is in the middle of these two. So that's 12.5. And 
and the upper bound is in the middle of those two, which is 17.5. Okay, now to the question. I want to find the upper bound of C. So I want C upper. So in order to make C as big as possible, or I need B to be as big as possible, but because I'm taking A away, I want to take away the smallest amount possible in order to make my overall value as big as possible. So I need to do B upper, which is 17.5. I need to take away A lower, which is 5.5. And this gives me an, an answer of 12. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing um, with the numbers to start with. I'm going to say that P is 8.4. Two significant figures means that I can only use two figures, so 8.5 and 8.3. So the lower is 8.35 and the upper is 8.45. I'm looking at Q next and we have 6.3. I can only use two figures, so it has to be 6.4 and 6.2. Halfway between them is 6.35 and 6.25. And finally, let's look at T. We've got 0 0.27. can only use two figures again, so it's 0 0.28, 0 0.26. We go halfway between 0 0.265 and 0 0.275. We then need to work out the upper bound of A. So I want A upper. So I'm going to want to make P as big as possible. I'm going to want to take away the smallest amount as I can. And I'm going to want to divide by the smallest amount I can. Because when I divide by a really small number, then my answer gets much bigger. Okay, so I just find out which, I just find the ones I need. So that's 8.45. Q lower is 6.25. And that's all over T lower, which is 0 0.265. And when I put this into my calculator, I get 8.3 to one decimal place. Okay, I think this topic is really accessible, but for some reason the question always ends up being like a 14 or a 15. So it's a really good idea to try and get this question um, uh, sorted and know how to do it. So exam questions above, and now I'm going to move on. Okay, uh, circle theorems. I'm not going to do any questions. I'm just going to talk through them, and then uh, the exam questions um, in the alternate video I would suggest you trying. So the first one is that angles at the center is twice the angles of the circumference. You can see here this angle will be 2x, that angle will be 1x. Sometimes the uh, shape is drawn not as an arrowhead, but can sometimes look like this, which can sometimes throw people. That angle is still 2x, that angle there is still 1x. Um, the next one, we have uh, the sort of bow tie theorem, or angles in the same segment are equal. So these angles will all be the same, as long as they come from the same two points down the bottom here. We next have a, um, a triangle inside a semicircle. So this line here has to be the diameter, and then every time this up here would be a right angle, 90 degrees. We have opposite angles in a cyclic quadrilateral sum to 180. So a cyclic quadrilateral means that every point on the quadrilateral lies on the circumference of the circle and then you can see here by the two colors the yellows will add to 180 and the purples will add to 180. We have tangents and radii meet at 90 degrees so a tangent is a line which touches the circle just once and then a radii obviously is from the center to the circumference and we have here that tangents from a point have equal length. Um, you also called, called the party hat, kind of looks like he's wearing a party hat. Um, and then finally, let me just move out the way. Ta-da! We have the alternate segment theorem, and that is when we have a tangent that comes across like this, and we have a triangle which touches the tangent and then also touches the circle up there. Then the purple angles are the same and the yellow angles there are the same. Right, I recommend trying some questions and watching the exam questions video. The link is over here, and I'm going to move on to the next topic now. Okay, so what does it mean? Well, it means that 
a to the intersection point times b to the intersection point will equal c to the intersection point times d to the intersection point. So what does that mean? Well, if I've got here to the intersection point, that's 10. And on the other side of that line, I've got x is the distance to the intersection point. So that's 10 times x. That will equal this distance to the intersection point, which is 3, multiplied by the distance on the other side, which is 15. Oops, 15. So that tells me that 10x is equal to 45, so x is equal to 4.5. Okay, now this question, the intersection point is on the outside, but never fear, we use the same um, routine. So first off, this point to the intersection is 9, times by this point P all the way to the intersection is not 11, 20. And that's equal to, on the other side, we have this point to the intersection is 10. And then we have this point over here to the intersection. Not x, x plus 10. And then we're good to solve. So this gives me... Um, 180 and this gives me 10x plus 100 minusing 100 from both sides and then dividing through by 10 gives me what I need okay there are some more tricky questions in the exam video uh, that involve uh, setting up quadratic equations so give those a go but this is the fundamentals that you need to know and now I'm going to move on to the next question okay set theory Number 38, you need to know all of the notation on the right hand side there. I'm not going to go through it, so but please do um, uh, read it and try and understand it. Okay, so let's go to the example now. So I've got a universal set, which means everything that needs to be included are the numbers 2 up to 20, up to 12, sorry. And A's are the odd numbers and P are, P are the prime numbers. So let's first look at the intersection. So that means all of the numbers which are in A and are in P. Sorry, I should call this P. So we have the odd primes, essentially, which are 3, 5, 7, and 11. Let's now look at A union P. Okay, so these are all of the numbers which are in a or P or both. So 2, that's in A, so it goes in. Uh, sorry, 2 is in P, so that goes in. 3 is odd, so, which is, so it's in A, so it goes in. 4 is in neither, so that can't come in. 5 is odd and prime, so that's definitely in. Um, 6 is neither. 7 is odd, so that's in. 9 is odd, so that's in. 11 is odd, and it's prime, so it's definitely in. And that is it. That's the, inter that's the union. Okay. Uh, then we can have a look at maybe not A. So these are all of the elements which are not odd, but they are in the universal set, of course. So we have 2, we have 4, we have 6, we have 8, we have 10, we have 12. And finally, we might get asked a question like this. Is P intersection not A equal to the empty set? Well, what does this mean? P intersection A are all the elements which are in P, so are prime, and are not odd. And the answer is no, it doesn't equal the empty set. And that is because... It actually has an element, it has the element 2. So 2 is in P not A dash. And because the reason why is because 2 is prime and it is also not in the odd numbers. 
Okay, link above, exam questions, let's move on. Venn diagrams. The trick here is you gotta start in the middle. Okay, let's get it. All, or six people here do all three sports. So, that, sorry, eight people. So they're gonna go right in the middle. I need to label my Venn diagram a bit better actually. So let's call uh, rugby A, let's call football B, and let's call cricket C. That's apt. Okay, so we've got that eight goes in the middle. We then look at the next line and it says that seven people, 17 people like rugby and football. So there is a huge temptation to write 17 in this section here. But that would be wrong because that would mean that actually 25 people like rugby and football. Instead, what we need to do is take 17 and then subtract the eight of the people who we've already counted, and that leaves me with nine. So that true intersection between rugby and football is 17 because it's nine plus eight. Okay, let's do the same thing for football and cricket. Let's take away eight, which will leave five. Let's do the same thing for rugby and cricket. Let's take away eight, that will leave 11. And then let's look at all the people that like football. That's 35 people. Again, don't write 35 in there because we've already counted nine, eight, and five people in the football circle. So what we need to do is 35 minus nine, minus eight, minus five, and that is equal to 13. So we put 13 in there. We're then gonna look at uh, cricket is 27, but what do we need to do? We need to take away the 11, the eight, and the five, and that leaves me with three. So that goes in here, and then finally 30 people like rugby, but I have to take away the 11, the eight, and the nine. So 11, nine, and eight, and that leaves me with, two and finally we need to figure out what goes on the outside the people who like none of these sports but what I'm going to do is add up all of the people who do like sports and they're in there and that is going to give me um, there's 30 in rugby and there's 13 there to make 43 add 5 makes 48 add 3 makes 51 there are 60 people in total, so 60, sorry, 60 minus 51 is equal to nine. So nine people need to go on the outside. Okay, exam questions normally follow up with like a probability question. So click the link to watch some of those. I'm now gonna move on. Number 40, rearranging formulae. Okay, let's do it. I want to make B the subject. At the moment, it's on the denominator, which I don't like at all. So the first thing I'm going to do is multiply both sides by B. And that gives me A times B. And the right side will be completely cancelled of the divide by B. And be left with just 3 plus C. And now, I want B on its own, so I'm going to divide by A. Which gives me B is equal to 3 plus C over A. And there we go, that's a fairly straightforward one. Let's move on. This is the more tricky question where X occurs twice. And what we need to do is we'll need to expand, factorize, and then redivide. Let me show you what I mean. Again, we've got a denominator here, we don't like that, so we move it to the other side and we do it by multiplying the other side by the denominator, and that cancels the denominator on the right side. I'm then going to multiply out these brackets. It's a really important step. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move all the terms that have an X in it to the other side, or in this case, the left side. And then everything which doesn't have an X in it is going to go over to the right side. So I'm going to get AX. I'm going to minus the X over. And I'm going to plus the AB to that side. So I get AB plus C, or C plus AB, doesn't make a difference. And now, here comes the key step, I'm gonna factorize this. I'm gonna take an X out, 
And this is what reduces the two x's occurring in this question down to just one. And that gives me a minus one is equal to a, b plus c. And then I need to divide through by that factor I've taken out of a minus one. So I get a, b plus c over a minus one. And we're done. A really key skill, um, exam questions above, I'm gonna move on. Okay, proof. Lots of people don't like this, but it's a topic you definitely can score marks on. And the things you need to remember are that even numbers are always two times some integer n. Odds are two n plus one, and consecutive numbers can be written as n, n plus one, n plus two, and so on. Okay, this question is asking us to prove that three uh, n plus one squared minus three n minus one squared is always a multiple of 12. Now, even if you don't know how to do this, you can always just expand the brackets and get a couple of marks like that. Okay, let's get it. So expanding the brackets, I would write three n minus, or sorry, plus one, whoops, what am I doing? Plus one squared is the same as three n plus one times by itself, minus three n minus one, again, times by itself. Let's expand these brackets. Three n times three n is nine n squared. Three n times one is plus three n. 1 times 3n is 3n and plus 1. Now, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to, because there's a minus sign there, I've got to be really careful. When I expand it, I'm going to put it into a big bracket like this. So I don't want to make this mistake of forgetting to use the minus sign on every single one of the terms. Okay, let's expand. I'm going to get 9n squared minus 3n minus 3n plus 1. Okay, great. Now I can uh, simplify. So this is 9n squared plus 6n plus 1. And I'm going to simplify this very carefully. I've got a minus needs to apply to everything inside the bracket. So I get minus 9n squared. This is going to give me minus 6n, but there's a minus outside, so it's going to give me plus 6n. And minus outside needs to be effect, needs to affect the one at the end, so minus one. Okay, great. We're going to get cancel, cancel. We're going to get cancel, cancel, and we're left with just twelve n. And this is clearly a multiple of twelve. So we are done. We've proved it. Okay, next question. Uh, prove that the sum of the squares of any two consecutive integers is always an odd number. Okay, great. Well, consecutive integers, I can use n and n plus 1. And I can do the sum, which means to plus. And it's asking for the squares, so I have to square these. And then we just expand. So we get n squared plus, this will be n plus 1, n plus 1. And that will be n squared Oops, that should be a plus. Plus n and another n is 2n and then plus 1. So this is 2n squared plus 2n plus 1. Now how do I show that is an odd number? Well, you can see that these are both multiplied by 2. So I can take a 2 out and I can write n squared plus n. I can close the brackets now and then still add that one on. And this is exactly what an odd number is. Two times something plus one. So because I've written it in this form, I can say that this is odd. And we're done. Exam questions above. Now I'm going to move on. 42 quadratic simultaneous equations. Classic question. Always got lots of marks, maybe five or six. And it's a really formulaic um type of question. So learn how to do it, get those marks. Here we go. So first off, I've already got it nicely, neatly in the form y equals. So that's great. I can just go straight into writing x squared plus, now y I'm going to replace with x minus 3, but it's y squared, so it's going to be x minus 3 squared. I'm then going to expand these brackets. Whoops. And I'm going to do it quite quickly here. 
and I'm going to get actually I'm going to write it out first make sure I get my method marks and I'm going to multiply using the crab method I get x squared minus 3x minus 3x plus 9 equals 17 this will simplify to 2x squared minus 6x and I'm going to minus the 17 over take it away from 9 which was going to give me minus 8 equals 0 now if you uh, can spot it you can see that there's a factor in your quadratic when it's equal to 0 then you can divide through by that factor x squared minus 3x minus 4 is much easier to factorize this gives me x minus 4 and x plus 1 which tells me that x equals 4 and x equals minus 1 and then what we need to do is go back to our original equation up here which tells me that the y variable is the x which is 4 minus 3 or the x which is minus 1 minus 3 so I get 1 and I get minus 4 it's always a good idea to put your answers as coordinates so x goes with 1 sorry 4 when x is 4 it goes with y is equal to 1 and when x is minus 1 it goes when y is equal to minus 4 and we might have a question where the uh, linear equation needs to be rearranged first uh, so there's a single y here so it's probably easier just to move the y over to the other side make it positive and then move the um, 3 over to the other side like this and now I've got y is equal to 2x minus 3 which means I can sub in so I get x squared plus 2x minus 3 squared is equal to 27 expanding that bracket is going to give me 2x times 2x which is 4x squared I'm going to get a 2x times by a minus 3 which is a minus 6x and I'm going to get another one as well and then I'm going to get a minus 3 times a minus 3 which is a plus 9 this is going to give me 5x squared minus 12x and then minus uh, 27 from 9 is going to give me minus 18 this doesn't factorize so I'd have to use the quadratic formula which is minus uh, minus 12 plus minus the square root of minus 12 all squared uh, minus 4 times by 5 times by minus 18 all over 2 times 5 and this will give me x values of 3.44 and checks notes minus 1.04 and then we go back to our original equation which should always be in terms of y because that's what you used to sub in and you need to double and minus 3 so if I double this and minus 3 it's going to give me 3.88 and then if I double this and minus 3 whoops it will give me minus 5.08 and we are done. Exam questions above. I'm going to move on. Number 43, recurring decimals. Uh, I'm going to show you my way that I like to do it. I think it's really quick and easy. Um, right, let's do it. So you start off by writing x. Um, you start off in the, kind of in the middle of the page and you write x equals uh, 0 0.4. 77777 7, 7, 7, 7. and that's because the recurring uh, decimal here is just the 7 and then because we've only got one digit reoccurring I'm going to times it by 10 to the power 1 also known as 10 and I'm going to write it above because it's going to make it easier for me subtracting so that basically means I just move the decimal point over so it's 4.77777777 so on and so forth and then you can subtract the equations. So we're going to get uh, all of these are going to cancel nice and neatly. And we're going to get 7 minus 4, which is 3. And we're going to get 4 minus 0, which is 4. And we're going to get 10x minus 1x, which is 9x. Okay, great. 
And so then we can say that x is equal to 4.3 over 9. Now we don't like having a decimal point in the fraction, so what I'm going to do is times the top and bottom by 10, and that's going to give me 43 over 90. Okay, here's another example, and this time we've got two digits reoccurring. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write um, in the middle of the page, I've just got enough, I've got enough space on the line above, um, 0 0.681818. Now, because we've got two digits reoccurring, I'm going to times by 10 to the power 2, which is 100. Or basically just a 1 with two zeros. And that's going to shift the decimal point two spaces, so I'm going to get 68 to jump to the front, 0.1818181. And we should get those decimals lining up using this method. Okay, cancel, 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 cancel. One minus six can't do, so borrow from the eight, turn that to a seven. Eleven minus six is five, and seven minus zero is seven, and six minus zero is six, and a hundred minus one is ninety-nine. We next divide through by 99 to get 67.5 over 99. Can't have a fraction in a decimal. Uh, sorry, can't have a decimal in a fraction. So I could times by 10, but actually easier enough, I could just times by two, top and bottom. So this gives me 135 and times the bottom gives me 198. And then each of these can be divided by 9, and that will give me 15 over 22. And we're done. Link above. Let's move on. Okay, number 44, direct and inverse proportion. We need to first work out the formula, and then we use the formula to work out a missing variable. Okay, let's do it. So the formulas that you need to remember are that direct is equal is y is equal to kx and inverse is y is equal to k over x. So we have here that a is directly proportional to b. So we write that a is proportional to b. And that means that a is equal to k times by b. We then use the condition which we're given and we sub that in to work out what k is. So when a is 7, we have k multiplied by 28. So dividing by 28 gives me 7 over 28, which is equal to 1 quarter. So our formula is now a is equal to 1 quarter b. And we're asked to work out what b is when a is 5. Well, I need to sub in a is 5, so I get 5 is equal to 1 quarter b. Multiply both sides by 4, gives me that 20 is equal to b. Next question, y is inversely proportional to the cube of x. Really important not to miss out that word when reading the question. So we write that y is proportional to 1 over the cube of x, so x cubed. And we do the 1 over because it is inversely proportional to. This tells me that y is equal to some constant k divided by x cubed. And then we take our conditions and we sub in. So y is 250, and that's equal to k over 0 0.2 cubed. So to find k, I would need to multiply 250 by 0 0.2 cubed. And this gives me that k is equal to 2. So now my new formula becomes y is equal to 2 over x cubed. And we're asked to work out the value of y when x equals 0 0.5. So I'm going to use this formula y is equal to 2 over, when x is 0 0.5, I put 0 0.5 cubed. And this gives me an answer of y is equal to 16. And there we have it. 
These questions are really formulaic and they end up being around question 14 or 15 on the paper. So it's a really good idea to master this topic because it gives you some good marks later on in the paper. Give the exam questions a go. We're going to move on now to the next topic. Okay, 45 histograms. The key to histograms is to know that the frequency is equal to the area and the frequency density is the frequency divided by the class width. Okay, let's do the example. You're going to want to write, write a frequency density column on your uh, table. So you take the frequency 20 and you divide it by the width and that width is the gap between the two points. So that's 10. So 20 divided by 10 is 2. We take 22 here and we divide it by 5, which is going to give you 4.4. You take 16 and you divide it by 5, which is going to give you 3.2. You take 13 and you divide it by 10, which is 1.3. And you take 9 and you divide it by 15, which gives you 0 0.6. Now we need to build our, um, our histogram. Uh, we're not given much to go on in terms of a graph, but never fear. The frequency density always goes on this axis here. And I can see the highest is 4, so if I go up in 1s, I'm going to be good. And going across, we're going to start at 20, and then I'm going to go to 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70. And that sounds good to me. The first one is between 20 and 30, and it goes up to a height of 2. So I draw my box like this, and then we've got from 30 to 35 goes up to 4.4. So we go across and then we go down like this. And then we have on 30 to 35 goes up to 3.2. And we have from 40 to 50 is 1.3. So there we go. And then finally, we have 50 to 65, which is 0 0.6. And don't always go all the way to the end. A lot of the time they leave it hanging there just to try and trick you. You need to make sure you go to 65, which is the end point. Okay, these questions where you have to interpret a histogram are very challenging, but this one is not too bad. Um, it says that 30 pigs weigh between 50 and 65. So this group in here, this section here, represents 30 pigs. So that area represents 30 pigs. And we can see that's quite nice and neat because we've got these sort of six mini boxes. So each of these will be five. And that will give me uh, the total area of 30 um, as we need it to be. And it says work out an estimate for the number of pigs which weigh more than 80. So I draw a line from 80 here. And I know that each of these boxes are five. And we go along and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven boxes there. So seven times five is going to give me 35 pigs. It says, explain why your answer is only an estimate. Well, what we're doing is we're assuming that this block here is evenly distributed between people who are, sorry, pigs that are less than 80 and greater than 80. So we don't know that to be the case. That block could easily be all pigs that are like 78. And we're just assuming that half of the pigs in that section are greater than 80. And we're done. Uh, these questions, I think, could get quite challenging. So try the exam questions if you want a challenge. And I'm going to move on to the next topic. Number 46 is similar shapes too. So important that you remember that the length scale factor, if we call it K, then the area scale factor is K squared and the volume scale factor is K cubed. And you can move between them by squaring, cubing or square rooting or cube rooting. OK, let's get into this question. Um, straight off the bat, I can see that we've got four and eight here and that's a linear measurement. It's just a distance. So therefore, that tells me that k is equal to 8 over 4, which is equal to 2. OK, we're now asked to work out the surface area. So if I want to move between 
areas, I'm going to have to use k squared to do that. And k squared will be 2 squared, which will be 4. OK, so part A, I need to work out the surface area of B. So to go from A to B, obviously we're multiplying because it's a larger shape. And we're taking the surface area, which we're told is 80, and we're going to multiply that not by 2, but by 2 squared, which is 4. And that's going to give me 320 centimeters squared. OK, for part B, we're now looking at volume. So as soon as I see the word volume, I'm going to need to work out what k cubed is. In this case, k was 2, so cube it, and that's going to give me 8. So that's what I'm going to use for this part of the question. The volume of the shape B is 600. So if I'm going backwards to A, I'm going to be dividing. So I take my 600 and I divide it. Because we're using volume, I'm using k cubed, which is 8. So 600 divided by 8 is 100 and oh, sorry, 75. So 75 centimeters cubed. OK, next question on this topic. This time, we're not given the linear scale factor or the length scale factor. We're only given a relationship between two areas. Now, that's going to give me k squared because that's the area scale factor. And I'm going to take the bigger one, which is 800, and divide it by the smaller one, 450. And that gives me 16 over 9, which is really reassuring because those are both square numbers. OK, I'm now asked to work out the volume. But before I can find the volume, I've got to work out the length scale factor, the linear, the linear one first. So k is equal to the square root of 16 over 9. I want to square root both sides of this equation to get my value for k. And that's going to be 4 over 3. That's really useful because now I can work out what k cubed is by just cubing that 4 over 3. And that's going to give me 64 over 27. OK, now I'm good to go. I can work out the volume of shape y, which is the larger one, remember. So I take the smaller one and I multiply it by the scale factor, or should I say the volume scale factor, which is 64 over 27. And this gives me 3,200 centimeters cubed. And that is it. That's done. These questions tend to be like towards like 16 or 17, and they are very accessible. So give some exam questions a go, and I'm going to move on now. Algebraic fractions a really key skill to learn, particularly if you want to take maths further than just GCSE. So in these questions, you're going to have to factorize and then try and do as much cancelling as possible. The worst thing you can do is start expanding brackets and getting cubes and, and to the power fours. That is never going to work. You've got to factorize and then try and simplify. OK, let's do it. Um, the first one, I can factorize the top and two numbers at times together to make minus 12 and add to minus 1 are minus 4 and plus 3. And on the bottom, two numbers at times together to make um, 20 and add together to make minus 9 are minus 4 and minus 5. And um, as you would expect, you are going to get, you're going to get, <coughs> excuse me, a, a factor which cancels on the top and the bottom. So you can leave your answer as x plus 3 over x minus 5. OK, again, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to factorize each of the terms. And I'm also going to flip the second one over and turn it into a times, because that's what we do when we divide fractions. So the first one can factorize to give me x plus 2 once I take out the 3. The bottom one, well, that one can't. I'm going to turn it into a times, and then I'm going to factorize the bottom, but I'm going to put it on the top. Now, that's a, that I can take out an x, and I can get x minus 4. Again, I'm reassured because I've got an x minus 4 on the bottom already, so that's going to be helpful. And this one needs to be factorized into a 2x and an x. And we are going to get 5 and 2. And we are going to get plus 2 over here to make 4. And 5 in here will make the 9. 
And I can also sneakily kind of expect to get an X plus two because I've got an X plus two at the top. Now we can cancel anything on the top line with anything on the bottom line. So what can I cancel? I've got an X minus four there, and that can go with the one on the bottom there. And I've got an X plus two, and that can go on the one on the bottom over there. As long as you've got one on the bottom, one on the top, you can cancel. So the top line now becomes three X, and the bottom becomes two X plus five. Okay, we might also be asked to work out um, adding or subtracting algebraic fractions, and also when they're equal to something, we have to solve. Now, when we have an when we're adding or subtracting, we need to find a common denominator. So I'm going to times the left fraction here, top and bottom, by the denominator of the right. That's going to give me seven, three x minus two, all over x plus one, three x minus two. And then I'm going to subtract, and I'm going to times this one, top and bottom, by the denominator on the left. So I'm going to get 4x plus 1. I'm going to get x plus 1 times by 3x minus 2. And that's equal to 1. Okay, great. Now I can combine these two fractions because they have the same denominator. So I can write 7, 3x minus 2, minus 4x plus 1 all over x plus 1, 3x minus 2. And that's equal to 1. Next step will be to multiply the denominator over to this side. And because it's times by 1, it's just going to be multiplied by whatever that denominator is. Okay, I'm going to do it up here. So I am... In fact, I'm also going to multiply out these brackets at the same time. So I'm going to get 7 times 3x is 21x. 7 times minus 2 is minus 14. I'm going to be very careful multiplying out this negative bracket here. I'm going to get minus 4x, and I'm going to get minus 4. And that's equal to 1 multiplied by x plus 1, 3x minus 2. Okay, let's simplify this left-hand side. 21x minus 4x is 17x. Minus 14 minus 4 is minus 18. Let's expand these brackets here. I'm going to get a 3x squared. I'm going to get a minus 2x. I'm going to get a plus 3x. And I'm going to get a minus 2. This is a quadratic, so I want it equal to zero. I'm going to move everything to the right-hand side. I'm going to get a 3x squared. I've got already a minus 2 plus a 3x, which is going to give me a plus 1. But then I'm going to minus 17. So 1 minus 17 is minus 16. And I'm going to add 18 to both sides. So that's going to give me plus 16. I now need to factorise this, so I'm going to use the uh, AC method, and the A and the C are 3 and 16, which gives me 48, and the B term is equal to minus 16. So two numbers that times together to make 48 and add to make minus 16 are minus 4 and minus 12. I then write 3x minus 4, 3x minus 12 all over 3 is equal to 0. Dividing the right bracket by 3 is going to give me 3x minus 4 and x minus 4. So my solutions are x equals 4 over 3 and x equals 4. And we are done. Okay, really tough topic this. I recommend trying some exam questions. The link is above. Now I'm going to move on. Okay, number 48, graph transformations. No easy way to say this. You're going to have to remember all of those graph transformations right there. I know, it's tough. But once you've known them, they'll be very useful for A-level. Uh, and they will get you some marks in the exam. Okay, let's do it. 
Uh, right, first off, we've got this minimum point here and we've got to figure out how it changes with all of these different graph transformations. Okay. Um, when you add three, it shifts the graph up by three, so the Y coordinate will change by three. So it's one, seven. When I have F of X minus one, that's a shift to the right by one. So the graph will shift to the right by one like that. And the X coordinate will change. So that will become two, four. F of minus X is a reflection in the Y axis. So the graph will then look like this. And that minimum point will be flipped over. So the X coordinate will change into a negative. So it'd be negative one, four. F of a uh, minus F of X, sorry, is a reflection in the Y axis. So the graph is going to look like this. And in this case, the X coordinate is going to stay in the same position, but the Y coordinate is going to turn negative. So that's one minus four. Y is equal to three F of X is a stretch in the Y axis like that, which means the Y coordinate is going to get multiplied by three. The X is going to stay where it is. So it's one twelve. Okay, we've got a, a double one here. We've got f of inside the bracket 2x. Now this is a bit strange. When it's inside the bracket, we do the opposite of what we'd expect. So it's going to be a not a stretch of a scale factor 2 in the x, but actually a compression by a scale factor of a half. So the graph is going to look like this. It's going to get squashed in the x-axis. So that's going to move the uh, coordinate, the x-coordinate to 0 0.5. And the Y coordinate is going to be affected by this plus three because that's going to shift the graph up by three. So that's going to give you seven in the Y. OK, F of two, uh, 0.25 of X. That is going to um, do the opposite of what you would expect. It's not going to compress it. It's actually going to stretch it out by a scale factor of Four, because it's a quarter inside, it's going to get stretched by a scale factor of four in the X. So that's going to look like something like that. And the X coordinate is going to get stretched by a scale factor of four. So it's going to be four times one, which is four. And the Y is going to stay the same. Okay, last one. Minus two F of X minus three. Um, we are going to reflect it first. That's the minus outside of the um, of the, the two f of x. Then the two is going to stretch it in the y axis. So it's then going to get stretched all the way down like that. And then the minus three is going to drop it down. Another three all the way down like that. So let's have a look what's going to happen. Well, you can see the X coordinate is actually going to stay the same. It's going to be unaffected. The Y coordinate was going to flip negative to minus four. It was then going to get stretched down by two. So by a scale factor of two, so that's minus eight. And then we're going to move it down by three further. So that's minus 11. Okay, yeah, no easy way of um, remembering these, but um, once you do remember them, then at least they are uh, there for A-level. Okay, moving on. 49 thirds. Let's do it. Root 50 can be written as the square root of 25 times the square root of 2, simply because 25 times 2 equals 50. And I've written it like that because 25 is a square number, so the square root of 25 is an integer, which is 5. So I've now written it in the form of k root 2, where k is an integer. Expanding brackets. I'd do it exactly the same way I would do any other bracket. It's a squared, so I'd have to write it out next to each other, next to itself, sorry. I'll do 3 times 3, which is 9. I'll do 3 times minus root 2, which is minus 
3 root 2. I would do minus root 2 times 3, which is minus 3 root 2. And then the final one, minus root 2 times minus root 2. Well, two minuses is going to make a plus. And root 2 times root 2 is just the same as um, root 4, which is 2. In fact, any roots multiplied by themselves, like so, it's just going to equal whatever that square root is. So that's going to give me 2. I'm now going to collect up the like terms. So I'm going to have the, um, the numbers here, the rational numbers, they're called 11. And I'm going to have the thirds, which are also called irrational numbers. And how many of those do I have? I've got minus 3 and another minus 3. So I've got minus 6 root 2. Rationalizing the denominator. Now, when I've got a denominator, which is a irrational number, i.e. a third, on the bottom, just on its own like that, then what I need to do is times the top by that third and the bottom by that third. Okay, what does that give us? Well, I can write that as 1 plus root 5 times by root 2, all over, now root 2 times root 2 is just 2. I can expand this um, bracket on the top to get root 2 times 1 which is root 2 and root 5 times root 2 well when we have two um, thirds like that multiplied together we're just going to get whatever those two numbers are multiplied together underneath a square root so that's root 10 and that's over 2 and now the denominator is a rational number rather than an irrational third now, this next type of question is when we have a rational and a third on the bottom. And the trick here is we need to multiply it top and bottom by that denominator, but with the sign changed. So one, or oh sorry, two minus root three. Two minus root three. Okay, so I could write this as a double bracket. It might make it look a bit easier and make it easier for us to expand out. If I have it in brackets like this and on the bottom, again, in brackets like this. So the top line, I get five times two, which is 10. I get five times minus root three, which is minus five root three. I get 2 root 3 times 2, which is 4 root 3. And I get 2 root 3 times minus root 3, which is minus 2 times 3, so minus 6. And on the bottom, I get 2 times 2, which is 4. 2 times minus root 3 is minus 2 root 3. And root 3 times 2 is plus 2 root 3. And then finally, root 3 times minus root 3 is minus 3. Okay, and as predicted, as always, the bottom thirds will cancel. And then all we're left to do is to um, simplify the top. So I've got 10 minus 6, which is 4. I've got minus 5 root 3 plus 4 root 3 gives me minus 1 root 3. And on the bottom, I have 4 minus 3, which is just 1. So I've just got 4 minus root 3. OK, a tricky topic, but also one which you can achieve marks. And when you expand the brackets, just make sure that you show you're working. And then you can do each individual step on your calculator. Um, and yeah, there we go. Exam questions above. Let's move on. 50 sectors of circles. The formulas are up there. Here is a sector. Let's work out the arc and the area. So the arc will be equal to 80 divided by 360. That's the fraction of the circle this sector is taking up. Multiplied by a circumference, which is 2 times pi times by r, which is 
and I get 7.26 centimeters. Okay, next, the area using the formula that 80 over 360 multiplied by pi times by the radius squared. And I put that into my calculator and that gives me 18.9 centimeters squared. Now here's a question where I need to reverse engineer in order to work out the area. So I have that the arc length is 15, but I don't know what this angle is, so let's call it theta. But I know the arc length is theta over 360 multiplied by 2 times by pi times by the radius, which is 12. So I'm going to reverse engineer this, and I'm going to divide 15 by 2 times 12 times pi is just 24 pi. And that's going to give me theta over 360, which is really helpful because I need theta over 360 to work out my area. So now I'm going to work out the area and I'm going to use that theta over 360, which is 15 over 24 pi. And I'm going to multiply that by pi r squared. Nice and neatly, the pi's will cancel, and then I can put the rest into my calculator. And that gives me 90 centimeters squared. Okay, notice the way that I didn't actually solve for theta. Instead, I solved for theta over 360. Just saves time, and also means you're less likely to make mistakes. Okay, exam questions above, let's move on. Number 51, 3D shapes. Uh, what I mean by that are cones and spheres. You're given the formula for the uh, surface area and volume of each of these. So it's just about applying these formulas. So let's work out the volume and the surface area of this shape here. Let's get it. Okay, so let's start with the volume. And the volume of the cone is equal to one third multiplied by pi times by r squared, which in this case is five, and multiplied by the height, in this case, which is 12. Great, so this gives me a value of 100 pi. Now let's look, look at the volume of the hemisphere. And the radius of the hemisphere is also 5. And the volume of the hemisphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed, but needs to be halved. So I'd write 2 thirds pi times 5 cubed. And this gives me uh, 250 pi over 3. So the total volume of this shape would be 100 pi plus 250 pi over 3. And I'll put that into my calculator. And that gives me 576 centimeters cubed. Okay, let's move on to the uh, surface area. I'll start with the surface area of the cone and what we need for that is the um, slanted height. So if I look at the cone and create a right angle triangle like such, I have 5 down the bottom, I have 12 as the height and I need the slanted height, let's call it L. So I have to use Pythagoras' theorem here. So it's the square root of 12 squared plus 5 squared, which is equal to 13. I can now apply the formula to work out the surface area of this cone. And that is pi multiplied by the radius multiplied by the slanted height 13. So that gives me 65 pi. Okay, now I can work out the surface area of the uh, hemisphere. 
and that's given as 4 pi r squared but again we have to half it because it is a hemisphere rather than a full sphere so it's 2 times by pi times by r squared which is 50 pi so the total volume is 65 pi sorry surface area is 65 pi plus 50 pi which is equal to 115 pi which gives me 361 centimeters squared great that's 3d shapes done some of these questions get really tough in the exam so give the exam questions a go and i'm going to move on to the next topic number 52 the sine and the cosine rule it's really important to know when to use these uh, first off, it's a right angle triangle, then we don't use them, we use Sokotoa and Pythagoras. If it's a non-right angle triangle, then that's when we use the sine and cosine rules. And the first thing we try and do is we inspect whether or not we have a side and its opposite angle. Because if we do, then it's the sine rule, and if we don't, then it's the cosine rule. Okay, let's get into the example. So do I have an angle and I know the side opposite? No, I don't. So therefore, it's the cosine rule. Now, the cosine rule is given in your formula booklet. It's a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cosine a. The capital A is always going to be the angle which is given or the one you're trying to find. So in that case, it is the uh, 100, which means that the side opposite is the little a. And which means these two sides are B and C, it doesn't matter which is which. So subbing in, A squared is, in this case, X squared. B squared is going to be 13 squared plus 10 squared minus 2 times 13 times 10 times by cosine of 100. This gives me 314.1. So then I need to square root that to get my um, distance. And I get 17.7. Next question. I asked myself the question, do I know a side and its angle opposite? Well, I don't know any of the angles, so I definitely don't. So therefore, again, it's the cosine rule. Now this time I need to rearrange it because I need to work out an angle. So again, I'm given this in my formula book at the front of my paper. And to rearrange it, I'm going to take this big block here and move it to the other side to get a positive 2BC cosine capital A. And that's plus A squared is equal to B squared plus C squared. I'm then going to subtract the a squared to get b squared plus c squared minus a squared. And then I'm going to divide through by that 2bc. And that's going to give me an expression for cosine of the angle, which is going to make it much easier when I'm trying to work out the angle. So that's the angle I'm looking for, x. It's going to, I'm going to label that capital A, and then that's going to be little a and that could be b and that could be c so i can write cosine of x is equal to b squared which is 15 squared plus c squared is 16 squared minus a squared which is 20 squared all over 2 times 15 times 16 which gives me that cosine x is equal to 0 0.167 sorry 875 and then to work out x I need to do cosine to the minus 1 of that value so I put that into my calculator and I get 80.3 degrees Okay, next question. I check, do I know an angle and an opposite side? In this case, yes, I do. And that means I need to use the sine rule. So the sine rule, I set it up by, if I'm looking for a length, in this case, which I am, I'll label that length um, little a, 
and I'll call this one capital A and I'll call this one little b and this one capital B. It literally, what I would also recommend is just scribbling out whatever the side lengths are called and just labeling these sides as you see fit. Okay, so the sine rule is A over sine capital A is equal to B over sine capital B. So in this case, A is what I'm looking for over sine of 42 is equal to B, which is five over sine of 53. So to find A, I would multiply that denominator to the other side. So I'd get five over sine 53 multiplied by sine 42. And that gives me 4.19 meters. Lovely. Okay, next question. Do I have that angle and a side opposite? Yes, I do. And this time I'm trying to work out the size of an angle. So what I'll do is I'll write the angle on top. So sine of x over its opposite side, which is 10, is equal to angle on top. So sine of 60 over its opposite side, 15. And now to get what I want, which is sine of x, I just need to multiply both sides by 10. Makes it much easier when you have it that way around. And this gives me that sine of x is equal to 0 0.577. So to find the x value, I just need to take the inverse of sine of this. Whoops, that should have been a 7 there. And this gives me a value of 35.3. degrees. And finally on this topic I'm going to include the area formula for a triangle which is a half a b sine of c. Things to remember is that the a and the b have to be next to each other and have the angle in between them and then we're good to go. So the area is equal to a half multiplied by, in this case, 5 times 8 multiplied by sine of 41. And this gives me an area of 13.1 meters squared to three significant figures. And that's it. Exam questions up above. Give them a go. And I'm going to move on to the next topic. 53, we're getting to the real tricky topics now, and this one is 3D Pythagoras and Trigonometry. And the top tip is to make sure that you draw a triangle inside of the shape, which at some point goes vertically downwards. I'll show you what I mean. So it says calculate the length AG first. So that is this long diagonal of the cuboid. First thing to do would be to draw a line connecting A and C and that way you have a triangle which goes vertically downwards like that. Okay let's work out the distance AC. Well I know that AD here is 5 and I know that CD is 8. So we can use Pythagoras on this triangle here of 5 and 8 to get AC. So AC squared is equal to the square root of 8 squared plus 5 squared uh, sorry, AC is equal to that, which is equal to the square root of 89. And I'll keep it in that form so I don't lose any accuracy. Okay, now do I know the height of this cuboid? Yes, I do. It is 4. So what I can do next is I can use this green and purple and dark blue triangle to work out the length which I'm looking for, which I will call x. So down the bottom I have root 89, on the side I have 4 and I'm looking for x. So x is equal to the square root of root 89 squared plus 4 squared. 
This gives me the square root of 105, which is equal to 10.2. Okay, next question, I'm going to have to use trigonometry. And I've been asked to work out the angle AFC. So the first thing I do is draw a line connecting A and F, and then a line connecting A and C, and then that vertical line straight down to make a right angle triangle. Now what sides do I know? Well I can work out AC, because that is a right angle triangle along the base with 10 and 7. So AC is going to equal the square root of 10 squared plus 7 squared which is going to be the square root of 100 plus 49, which is 149. Next, I can look at this triangle here, which has 7. It has one of the sides I'm looking for, and it also has a 30 degree angle. So I'll draw that triangle out here. 30 degrees, 7, and this side, FC, is what I'm looking for. Okay, great. So we're going to use uh, tan here. I'll just draw a quick tan triangle down the bottom, we have tan of the angle O and A. I'm looking for O, so I cover up O, which tells me I have to do tan times by A. So FC of 30 multiplied by 7. And this gives me 7 root 3 over 3. Again, I'm going to keep it in its exact form until I get my final answer. Okay, so now we have enough information to look at the big triangle, which I will draw out like this. So we have the base down the bottom, which we know is root 149. We have the height down the side, which we know is 7 root 3 over 3. And we need to find this angle, let's call it theta. So again, I've got the opposite and the adjacent, so I'm going to use uh, tan. So I'm going to write that tan theta is equal to the opposite over the adjacent. And then I'm going to do tan to the minus 1 on my calculator of that answer in order for me to get the answer. And that is 18.3 degrees. Okay, lots of good exam questions right here. Click the link. Uh, 54, completing the square. Lots of students hate this topic, but it's really straightforward if you know the golden rule. And that is that it all revolves around this term here, the B term. Okay, let me show you how. We take the B term and we half it. So in this case, we get 5. And we then write that x plus 5 squared minus, and always minus, that number again, 5 squared plus anything added on, yes, 2. And that's it. We literally just take that number 10 and we half it and we put it in there and there, and then we're good to go. So this gives me x plus 5 squared now I take away 5 squared, so that's minus 25, but I add 2, so it's minus 23. Okay, so it does get a little bit trickier when we've got a, um, a in this case, a 2x squared. But never fear. First step is just to divide, or sort of say factorize, a 2 out of the uh, quadratic. So dividing through by 2 is going to be x squared minus 6x. Now you can either keep the 23 inside or outside. Personally, I prefer to keep it outside. But you could put it inside and divide it by 2. It's your own preference. And now what we do is we look at inside this square bracket and we look at the B term again. And that B term is minus 6, so all we do is half it. So I write x, that value halved, so minus 3 all squared, always minus, that value halved again, squared, and in this case there's nothing to add on, so just close that bracket. 
Okay, now let's work out what's inside this square bracket. We're going to have minus, minus 3 squared is 9, so it's just going to be minus 9. So it's going to be two lots of x minus 3 squared minus 9. And then we're going to multiply out that square bracket, which means I just times everything inside by 2. So I get this, I get minus 18, I've still got this plus 23, so that simplifies to 2, x minus 3 all squared, and then minus, nope, sorry, plus 5. And that's completing the square, done. Um, exam questions, let's move on. 55, equation of straight lines, 2. This is where we introduce perpendicular lines. And the formula is that the perpendicular gradient is always a negative reciprocal. Okay, let's get it. Okay, so we're told that this line has a gradient of a half. So to find the perpendicular gradient, I'll call that M2, I just take minus 1 and I divide by M1, the original gradient. So the perpendicular gradient here is minus 1 divided by a half, and that is minus 2. Another way of thinking about it is flipping over the gradient and then just turning the sign from a positive to a negative in this case. And it passes through 0, 7, which tells me what the y-intercept is straight away, because that's where it crosses the y-axis. So it's just minus 2x plus 7. And now we're looking for a parallel line which passes through 0, minus 3. Well, I need to work out what the gradient is. So I'm going to move everything over to the right-hand side other than the y term, which is going to give me this. I'm then going to divide through by 5 so I get y on its own. That's perfect. And now I can tell what the gradient is. It's minus 2 over 5. And I know it passes through 0 minus 3. And 0 minus 3 is the y-intercept. So my answer is y is equal to minus 2 over 5x minus 3. Lovely. OK, we've got two coordinates. And we asked to find the perpendicular line to a that passes through a different coordinate. So first, let's work out the gradient of line A. So the gradient is equal to the change in the Y. So we go from 7 to 5 in the Y and in the X I go from 5 to 1. So that is a change of 2 over a change of 4 so that is a half. Okay so what is the perpendicular gradient? Well that is the minus 1 divided by, in this case, a half. So that is going to give me positive 2. Uh, sorry, negative 2. And then we need to um, work, find the equation of a line that goes through this point. So I write y is equal to mx plus c. I write y is equal to minus 2 x plus c because the gradient is minus 2 and then I sub in the point that I know it passes through so where y is 7 and where x is minus 1 this gives me 7 is equal to 2 plus c so I get that 5 must equal c so therefore my equation is y equals minus 2x plus 5. Okay, try the exam questions because this topic can get really hard really quickly. And having good practice of these exam questions will be great. So have give that a go and I'm now going to move on. 56 functions, not much to say about them really. Let's just get straight into it. Okay. Uh, g of 2 basically means sub 2 into g. So we get 2, 2 squared minus 10, 
and that's equal to 8 minus 10, which is minus 2. g of minus 2 means sub in minus 2 into g. So I get 2 minus 2 squared minus 10, and this gives me well, exactly the same thing, 8 minus 10, which is equal to minus 2. And then solve g of x is equal to 8. Well, g of x is 2x squared minus 10. And if that equals 8, then 2x squared is equal to 18, which means x squared is equal to 9, which means that x is equal to plus or minus 3. Done. Next one, a composite function. Find f of g of x. So I take x and I put it into g, and that gives me x squared. And then I take that and I put it into f, which means I write out f, but I replace any x's with x squared. So this becomes 3x squared plus 1. And now work out an expression for g of f of x. So I take x and I put it into f which gives me 3x plus 1. And then I take that as my new input and put it into g, which means I write out g, but I replace the x with 3x plus 1. So it becomes 3x plus 1 squared. Here I'm asked to work out the inverse function. So what I'll do is I'll take g and I'll write that as y is equal to x plus 3. I will then swap the x and the y over. So the x's replace the y's and the y's replace the x's. I will then make y the subject by subtracting 3 from both sides. And then I will write that g to the minus 1 of x is equal to x minus 3. And that's how you find the inverse function. Okay, let's do the same for f. I write y is equal to x squared minus 17. I swap the x's for the y's. I then make steps to make y the subject by adding 17 to both sides. And then finally, square rooting. So the square root of x plus 17 is equal to y. And then I finally say that f to the minus 1 of x is equal to that square root of x plus 17. And we're done. Now, these questions were quite straightforward. Functions can get very hard very quickly. So click the link to watch the exam questions, which are much more challenging. OK, let's move on. Differentiation. If you're watching this and you're just doing the regular GCSE, then you don't need to know this. But for IGCSE, you certainly do. And it always comes at the end of the paper. But really, there is lots of accessible marks here because being able to differentiate is quite straightforward. Applying it is the tricky part. OK, let's show you how to differentiate. So we take the power and we multiply it by the coefficient and then we drop the power down by one. And that's it. So 3 times 2 gives me 6, and then the power gets dropped down by 1. And this is to work out the gradient function dy by dx. Here, 2 times by 3 gives me 6, and when I drop the power down by 1, I get x to the 1, which is just x itself. And then finally, any constant added on will always differentiate to 0. So if there's no x in the term, it will go to 0. And that's how we differentiate. OK, here's a question where I need to apply some of that knowledge. First off, I need to differentiate. So dy by dx is equal to 3 times 4 is 12. Drop the power down, x squared. That's 2 to the 1. So 1 times 2 is just 2. So that becomes minus 2. And then when the x gets dropped down to 0, well, anything to the power of 0 is just timesing by 1. So I don't need to write it. And any constant differentiates to zero. It says find the coordinates of the two points on the curve where the gradient of the curve is one. Well, what is dy by dx? It is the gradient function. So essentially, dy by dx is the gradient. And we've been asked to set it equal to one. 
So I say 1 is equal to 12x squared minus 2. I'll add 2 to both sides. I'll divide through by 12, which will give me a quarter is equal to x squared. And then I will square root, so I'll get x is equal to plus or minus the square root of a quarter, which is equal to plus or minus a half. But we're not done there because it's asked us for the coordinates. So I'll need to substitute back into my original function to find the y values that correspond. So I'm going to write that y is equal to 4, a half to the power of 3 minus 2 times a half plus 5. And also y is equal to 4 to the minus a half to the power of 3 minus 2 to the minus a half plus 5. So we're going to get two values for y. That's going to give me 4.5 and 5.5. And the final thing we need to know is that stationary points occur when dy by dx equals 0. That's when the tangent or the gradient at that point is flat. It's where the gradient equals 0. Okay, let's do this question. Find dy by dx. So 3 times 1 is 3. Drop the power down. Um, 1 times minus 12 is minus 12. Drop the power down. x to the 0 is just 1. Don't need to write it down. And any constant differentiates to 0. Find the gradient of the curve at the point B. Well, I know that point B has an x value of equal to 0. So the gradient at that point, dy by dx, is 3 sub in 0 minus 12, and that is minus 12. Just a little sense check, it's got a negative gradient. It's going downwards from left to right, so minus 12 makes sense. Now find the coordinates of a and c, the two turning points. So I set the gradient function equal to 0 to find where the stationary points are also called turning points. This is going to give me 3x squared is equal to 12, so x squared is equal to 4, so x is equal to plus or minus 2. And then, just like the previous question, you've got to work out the coordinates, so you need the corresponding y values. So you need to sub in minus 2, like so, and you need to sub in plus 2. like so. And here you get 33 and here you get 1. And we are done. Have a go at some of the exam questions because there are a few which are quite tricky and some we have to apply them to different shapes. So give those a go and I'm going to move on now. Kinematics using differentiation is always at the back end of the paper. It's meant to be really tricky but it's actually quite attainable, and I'm going to show you why. So first off, we must know that S represents displacement, and that differentiates down to velocity, which differentiates down to acceleration. And once you know that, and you know how to differentiate, there's certainly lots of marks can pick up on these types of questions. So find an expression for the velocity. So the velocity is equal to the change in the displacement with respect to time. So I just differentiate this function. Uh, the 3 times by the 1, and then drop the power down. The 2 times by the minus 5, and then drop the power down. And the constant differentiates to 0. And that's part A done. Part B, it says find the time at which the acceleration of the particle is equal to 20. Well, I need to differentiate again to get acceleration, because the acceleration is the change in the velocity with respect to time. 6t minus 10. And we're asked to find the time at which is equal to 20. So I set it equal to 20. I add 10 to both sides. And then I divide through by 6. And I get t is equal to 5. And that's it. 
These questions are really accessible and they always come right at the back end of the paper. So do try these exam questions. It's a great way of getting marks at the back of the paper. Okay, let's move on. Sequences. Tricky, tricky topic. You've got to know the nth term formula, which I've written at the top there. The summation formula, which is given in the formula booklet, but you need to know how to use it and that the A is the first time, D is the difference, and N is the position. Okay, let's get into this question then. So I'm told the third term of, this, of the series is 19. So I can use this first um, formula, and that tells me that um, A of the third position is equal to the first term A plus N is 3, so 3 minus 1, times by d and that's equal to 19 so I can simplify this and write that a is equal so a plus 2d is equal to 19 great that's one equation I'm then going to use the second line of this question to find a second equation and that's that the sum of the first 10 terms is equal to 290 but it's also equal to using the formula 10 over 2 square brackets 2a plus 10 minus 1d close bracket and that's equal to 290. Okay let's simplify this that gives me 5 2a plus 9d is equal to 290. I can divide both sides by 5 which is going to give me that 2a plus 9d is equal to 58. I've now got two equations in terms of a and d. So I can solve these simultaneously. I'm going to times the top one by 2. And that's going to give me 2a plus 4d is equal to 38. And then I'm going to write the bottom one just on top here. 2a plus 9d is equal to 58. I can subtract these two equations to get that 5d is equal to 20. So d is equal to 4. And then let's sub it back into this top equation here. And this tells me that a plus 2d is equal to 19. Now 2d is 2 times 4, which is 8. So a must equal 11. Great. Now I can work out the temp term by using the nth formula term at the top here. So I want a10, and that's equal to a, which is 11, plus n, which is 10, minus 1, multiplied by d, which is 4. So this gives me 11 plus 9 times 4, which gives me 11 plus 36, which gives me 47. Okay, that's a classic question which combines the summation and also the uh, nth term. These questions are really tricky, so give them a go. The exam questions above, and I've also got a question. Um, we've made it to the end. Number 60, and it's vectors, so I think this is the hardest topic. And um, I'm just doing a quick example here. I'm not getting into the really difficult exam questions. You can watch other videos that I have of those. For example, this video here, which is um, what I think is one of the hardest uh, vectors questions you can get. Uh, but this is just the basics in just a couple of minutes. Okay, let's do it. So it's asking me first to find A to B. So A to B, well, I can't go down that way because I don't know any of the uh, little mini vectors. I can go back this way, so that's minus 5a. It's going against the direction of 5a. And then I can go this way along, which is going with the direction of 3b. Okay, next, that vector I just worked out took me from a to b. If I wanna go from a to m, then it's just half of the blue vector. So I just need to half this vector I've already created. So it's minus 5 over 2a 
plus 3 over 2b. And now I've got this a to m and I'm being asked to work out o to m. So that would be this yellow one plus the green one. And the yellow one is 5a and I'd add on minus 5 over 2a plus 3 over 2b. And that will give me 5 over 2a plus 13 over 2b. And that's just a quick crash course in how to work out vectors. I'd recommend trying the exam questions uh, and have me explain some of the really tricky questions in the video right above. Okay, that's it. We're finished. Thanks for watching. I really hope you enjoyed that and learned a lot. Um, I have a past paper questions and I'm also going to be doing lots of stuff over the exam period. And I also do A level. So once you finish your GCSEs, stay subscribed and enjoy. Bye for now.